for one, and welcome to episode 187 of At Odds with Wrestling. Joe and Adam here. Adam, hello. How are you? I'm fine. 187. This has got to be like New Jack theme music at some point or something like that. Right. If I was more prepared, and I do have the blessing from uh, Mike from Virtual Pros, uh, a lot of times they would do a segment where he would like rant and shit on someone. And they would play, like, the instrumental of Natural Born Killers underneath him as he did it. <laughs> okay. And he told me, since they haven't done a show in, like, almost a year, that I have his blessing. That if I ever want to do it when I shit on someone, I can. <laughs> okay. Um, but I wasn't thinking. Like, I, I see, you're saying 187, you think New Jack. I think uh, Homicide, because he's the notorious 187, you know? Uh, yeah, it's all all interchangeable. Yeah. Well, not really. Homicide <laughs> kind of got a bad rep early in his career because, you know, the the name and the look and the gear and everything else like that. And everyone's like, oh, well, he's just a New Jack ripoff. Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, new, Homicide's not a New Jack ripoff. Homicide's pretty awesome. All right. Well, I don't want to derail the show anymore, Joe. Hey, we have a thousand calls, so we should just move on to the to the wrestling and talk. Well, hang on. Before we do, I want to uh, uh, apologize to you, not that you care, and oh. also apologize to our listeners, because last week was like a banner week of me shitting the bed on all the shows, right? How so? Uh, so I, I was having issues with the WordPress site uh, that everything is run through, and I thought I put out the main show for Longbox Heroes, and I accidentally put out the After Dark show for Longbox Heroes. Okay. And then last week, uh, I put out this show, and it wasn't until uh, Ken Cannon messaged me at, like, 7 o'clock in the morning. It's like, hey, you put out a post, but there was no file with it. Because <laughs> it was giving me issues with the image. I was trying to, put like, attach the image to the post, and yeah. it kept giving me an error message saying that the image was too big. Okay. That I needed to clear out some of the space. And I'm like, what the fuck? This image, like, I've shrunk this image down as much as I can and still making it visible. Because when the post initially went out, I just put, like, one of the old generic logos with it. And I put it up on Tumblr with the image because I always like to share your work that you do. Um, you know, the hard, painstaking photoshops that you make. <laughs> yes. De- definitely not slapped together at the last right. Photoshop. Yeah. <laughs> right. And then... I either I forgot to or like the the file didn't attach to the post right when it went out because I was having issues or whatever the fuck was going on. So like it was just like like I was just having a week and hopefully we won't have these things happen today. Fingers crossed. Yeah, you need if you can figure out or if it tells you somewhere in that process what the like Goldilocks ratio of the photo should be like, is it a certain aspect ratio? Is it a certain pixel count like i can modify because i know that sometimes i give them to you and they work but like it's cropped weird and you don't see the top of the picture or sometimes obviously it just doesn't work at all like if there's a certain perfect storm of a a size for a picture i can try to like provide you with that before you try to post it i so what i usually do is i just run it through like your general uh image editor you know yeah um and I just put it down to like fit for a website. And it's a little bit of that. And it's also a little bit of like the way when the post goes up, it puts like the little wrestling banner and it puts the date in it. So sometimes that covers stuff up. Yeah. And I remember many, 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 many moons ago, like very early in the thing, I had said to you, like, just generally, like, ah, oh, you need to make these pictures smaller. Yeah. But I didn't give you like any definitive direction on that. It was just make the post smaller. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times I'm just, you know, working with a screenshot of something I found on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, There's worst case scenarios where I'm taking a picture of something I see on my TV just because I can't find the picture anywhere online. Um, Yeah. But for anybody who's taking notes and, you know, is a follower of our, uh, you know, what is it, show images – uh, this week's image, I was outvoted on the, yes. the at odds booking committee two to one voted me down on what the show image was going to be for this week. So go check out our Instagram. If you want to see my selection, I'll post right. that tomorrow. <laughs> and you could let us know which one we should have went with. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but let's get into, uh, this day in wrestling history. Cause there's a bunch of shit, man. All right. And now at odds with wrestling presents... This day in wrestling history. 
I have to try to keep the Skype up when I'm doing the uh, the audio share with you so that when you send me a message, like the whole Skype thing lights up so I don't miss it, you know? Yeah, no worries. Because you typically tend to skedaddle during musical stings. <laughs> That's what I have to, I have to go powder my nose. <laughs> yes. Hmm. Uh, so this day, wrestling history, again, we always go by air dates as opposed to recording dates. Uh, 1990 aired an episode of Saturday Night's Main Event, which was a follow-up to WrestleMania 6. Uh, we had Hulk Hogan taking on Mr. Perfect, Herquak taking on Hillbilly Jim, uh, Warrior, uh, in his first defense of the title that he had just won from the, uh, Hulkster at WrestleMania 6, taking on Haku, a rematch from WrestleMania 6 of the Big Boss Man versus Akeem, and a rare babyface versus babyface match of the Hart Foundation versus the Rockers that ends up in a schmoz with the not-yet-turned-but-getting-ready-to-turn heel demolition doing a run-in. I think I saw some gifts from this earlier today on Twitter, and this is like a perfect Hasbro era card. Oh, I'm yeah. Just looking at it, I'm like, oh, man, if this was on, I would watch it. I'm not going to go seek it out. But if it was on TV right now, I'd ha- it'd have my attention. <laughs> of this of this aired card, only Hillbilly Jim and Haku did not have LJNs. Or uh, uh, Hasbro's, rather. Yeah, no, you're right. Uh, even though Brett and Anvil would be much later. No, Anvil didn't have one either, right? Or did he? Had, he? he had a new foundation, I think. That's right. He had the new foundation one to go with the Owen new foundation. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so also on this day in wrestling history, uh, 1996 was In Your House, Good Friends, Better Enemies uh, from the Omaha Civic Center in Omaha, Nebraska. And that is important. Um, this is a very famous in your house, uh, because it is the last world wrestling entertainment matches for several years, televised matches, at least for Razor Ramon and Diesel before they would go to WCW to, to kickstart the NWO angle literally a month later. Okay. Uh, this was Vader against Razor Ramon. Uh, I remember like the promos building this up, like. Razor's promos were really weird. Like he acknowledges his suspension. Um, and then he talked about the match with Vader. Um, the Vader promos is Jim Cornette saying that Razor Ramon has recently made some bad business decisions. <laughs> uh, so it's like real weird. Like these are like the like these weren't like the localized promos. These were like the promos that were airing on Raw to hype up this match. Uh, and then Sean versus Diesel in the no DQ match, which is really, really good. Um, this is when they take off Mad Dog Vachon's leg and use that in the, th- in the match. Um, and Diesel had some bangers, man, in like 95, 96. And this was like one of the last great matches that he had. Yeah, and Sh- Sean was champ at this time, right? Sean was champ. He had just won it in the uh, Iron Man match from Brett at the Mania prior. Yes. Okay. I, I think in my like knowing it's it's fake but still kind of being young enough and stupid enough to think that things could change i remember watching this and being like man maybe if diesel wins this and wins the title he won't leave (laughs) because i think the dirt sheets you know or aol chat rooms that already clued me in that they were leaving so i was like oh well maybe he'll get the win and he'll be stuck here as i didn't want him to leave (laughs) you know uh but also on this card was the arguably one of the worst matches in this era of WWE was Ultimate Warrior versus Goldust for the Intercontinental title. Well, I'll tell you, that Dustin's never been a good worker. Well, <laughs> okay, so Dustin was hurt going into this match, and they essentially false advertised this match happening. There was a bunch of, like, shenanigans that happened um, where the match just ends up getting thrown out. Goldust ha- introduces his one-time-ever-used bodyguard, who was, and I forget the timeline, if he had just come off, or this is, no, this is what led to him getting the stint as Mantar, Bruiser Mastino, right? (laughs) Yeah. So that there was someone for, like, Warrior to bump around in the match, because Goldust was hurt, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And I think on the free-for-all, they did a thing where, like, because Goldust was still feuding with Ahmed Johnson at the time, and there was a thing backstage, and they're like, oh, Goldust slipped backstage and is hurt. Okay. It was really weird, and the like, I, like as good as the Sean Diesel matches, go watch Warrior Goldust just to see how weird it is. 
<laughs> All right, I'm also looking at this uh, Bulldog and Owen versus Jake and Ahmed. Right. And at least half of that match seems good. Ha- oh, half of the competitors seem like they can work. <laughs> yeah, well, one-fourth, sure. <laughs> yeah, maybe, I guess. Uh, but also, so then we have our 1997, which is our head-to-head, uh, you know, Raw versus Nitro. Uh, Nitro for the next, like, month is only an hour because of the basketball playoffs. Yeah, okay. Uh, but there's, you know, there's still interesting stuff. But the big program on Nitro is the NWO, specifically Hall, Nash, and Six, against uh, Flair, Piper, and Kevin Green. Of course. Uh, that's really like the big program. Hogan's off doing a movie. Um, you know, you're getting like whatever you're getting during the course of the show, but it's an hour. So it's like a flash through whatever. Right. Yeah. Uh, raw on the other hand. And again, this is one of those weird things I love doing to look at these, this day in wrestling history, 1996 in your house was at the civic center in Omaha, Nebraska. One year later, raw at the same building. Yeah, because crowds are getting bigger. I get well, not really, <laughs> because like this is now the second week in a row where it's a raw where there's like a thread through the episode. Like, are there matches of like Flash Funk versus Rockabilly and Vader versus Jesse James, the real Double J? <laughs> um, your like B program is Goldust versus Triple H, right? Yeah, but the A program that runs throughout the course of the show is Austin and Bret Hart, and this is the further formation of the Hart Foundation, where uh, Pillman comes out and he tries to lure Austin to the ring so Bret and o- or Owen and Davey could get him. Uh, this is the debut of Bret in the wheelchair because he got injured the week before, um, and this is like him starting to really cut the promos on how like the American fans stink. And how the international fans are better. <laughs> okay. uh, There's also the return of the Anvil as part of the Heart Foundation. And, like, I think it's, like, next week's Raw where they're, like, officially all together as, like, a cohesive unit. The Heart, the This iteration of the Heart Foundation. Okay. I, I was a big fan of the Heart Foundation there. Don't tell anybody. We can cut it out when this show makes the air. But, <laughs> like, <laughs> like huge fan of that like just when that stable formed yeah and this is and like like last like you know obviously it's been building but like last week and this week and next week are like the real like this is where it all like really happens you know okay um and also owen beats uh rocky maivia for the intercontinental title on this episode of raw hmm I wonder if that Rocky guy ended up doing anything down the future I hear he's real busy that's all (laughs) I think I know about yes he's really busy (laughs) Um, And last but not least, uh, on this day in 2005, uh, Chris Candido passed away. Hmm. And uh, Chris Candido was awesome, man. Um, You know, like he got like he got a raw deal in WWE for a variety of reasons. But you go look at the stuff that he did pre WWF and Smoky Mountain, the stuff that he did post WWE and ECW. And listen, man, he had his demons and he went through a lot of whatever. Um, He had a little bit of a run in WCW uh, toward their waning days in like 99, 2000. And then like 2004, he got his shit together, man. And he was like back on the indies. And he was like having all these like really cool matches. And then he gets the deal with TNA. And then he ends up like breaking his leg and then getting an infection and ends up taking a flight home, and on the flight home, he gets blood clots in his legs, and that's what ends up killing him. Jeez. It's, it's, it sucks to say, but it's kind of like the Scott Hall situation, you know? Yeah. Hmm. And it was like, he was like having a career resurgence, and, you know, this is a guy who, I think he might have been like 39 when he passed. He was like super young, and especially today, um... You know, if you listen to the major wrestling figure podcast, you hear how much uh, Brian talks about Candido, you know? Yeah. And I remember going to, like, the ECW shows a bunch. And, like, when they would do shows at the CYC, whether it be, like, the TV matches or whatever it was, and he would just have, like, a random match, like, with, like, Balls Mahoney, who was his buddy, or Axel Rotten, or whoever it was. And he would just do, like, the dumbest shtick ever. And it just got over because he sold it so well. 
And I'm going to see if I could find it here. And I'm going to put it in the show notes. And if you know, you know. Um, but October of 2004 in IWA Mid-South. I know it's on IWA Mid-South's uh, YouTube channel, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and this is just how my life works. I was at this show. Because uh, this is when I was traveling a little bit with the... Uh, the Ring of Honor kids doing, uh, like, they were getting bookings and stuff. And, you know, they needed, like, somebody else to, like, drive or cover gas or whatever it was. And that ended up being me. Um, <laughs> but the match is uh, Chris Candino, uh, Metalhead Steve Stone, again, local guy, uh, Claudio and Nigel McGinnis against uh, Punk, Ace Steel, uh, Danny Daniels, again, local guy, and Matt Seidel. Okay. And it's essentially a comedy match. And it's hilarious. Like, they just do, like, every cornball shtick thing uh, that you could ever do. And it was part of, like, a strong-style tournament. And this was the comedy match <laughs> on the strong-style tournament. Like, these eight guys going out there and just, like, fucking around for 20 minutes. All right, I'll check that out. That's uh, like, extra yeah, if you've never home. seen it, not homework. If you've never seen it, uh, if you just search IWA Mid South Chris Candido, it's like the second thing that comes up. Um, it's absolutely worth your time to check it out. Yeah. All right, I'll check that out. Yeah, yeah. Candido's one of those guys that, like, you know, obviously I didn't know shit about him prior to the WWF. You know, didn't care about the Body Donnas other than maybe their valet. Mm. <laughs> but when they went, when he went to ECW, you know, they did a good job of just saying, "Here's a wrestler, enjoy." You know, and it, it, the presentation was awesome, and he, you know, big. I, I was a fan of his ECW run, you know. So, yeah, he he did a good job of like mixing like being a goofy, over the top sort of guy. Mm-hmm. Um, with uh, like a super serious, super good wrestler, you know. Yeah, and obviously the triple threat stuff was awesome. Absolutely. So hey, let's get into stuff from this past week, I guess. All right, let's do it. Um, I, not so much a talking point, but I just wanted to make a reference to this at the very beginning. And Joe, a lot of times we don't appreciate what we have until it's gone from our lives. Oh. And I just want to take a moment to recognize and just say thank you to the inspiration who have announced that they're taking an indefinite leave away from wrestling for for reasons unknown, but speculated heavily upon. And uh, I I know that myself and at least one other listener of the show, uh, this hurt us deeply. And uh, if we can just do a moment of silence, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. That's all. <laughs> all right. Well, I know one of our listeners would feel that way about one of the two for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just sad that we never got my proposed dream match of the handicap match of the two of them against Minoru Suzuki. <laughs> uh, you know, when Suzuki was taking American bookings and everyone's posting their dream matches, we were on our, uh, the family and I were on our way to uh, Hershey Park. And it was one of those things. My wife's driving, so I get to make all my jerk off remarks on Twitter. And that was my joke. And it got some, you know, it got some decent traction, whatever, you know? (laughs) Yeah. All right. But I will start it off with something serious. We could talk about not serious, but my first real point. And I will say it wasn't the greatest match ever, but it had some really good spots. And it just furthers my storyline of giving props to at least one of the competitors in the match. But I want to talk about the main event from dynamite this week, which was the TNT championship ladder match where Scorpio Sky defeated Sammy Guevara. Uh, Like I said, not like the best ladder match in the world, not even the best one on TV this year, but it had its car crash moments. Uh, It had a lot of Tay Conti versus Paige Van Zandt just putting on a striking clinic. Hmm. Uh, (laughs) And uh, we got to see more of the biggest baby face in all professional wrestling, Dan Lambert. Uh, I liked all of it. I liked all of it. It was, uh, again, nothing that I will remember after this week. But as far as TV main events go, it was a good time. Uh, So I have a a lot of memorable moments uh, in this match. I remember how stiff that dick kick that Tay Conte gave to (laughs) Dan Lambert was. Yeah, that was uh, a working kick. <laughs> I remember Sammy taking that insane fucking bump on the barbed wire ladder and then no selling it, right? Whatever. 
<laughs> that's how wrestling is these days. I can't be upset by it. But I also remember Sammy almost dying on that dive where he like he's climbing up the ladder. He reaches for the belt. It's not close. He looks into the camera and does like the I'm crazy thing. And then he just like ass necks himself off the top off the top of the ladder. Like if he waited literally two more seconds, Scorpio would have been in the right position. But he's yeah. just like, fuck it, I'm going for it. And does this huge flipping dive off the ladder. It lands like right on his neck. Yeah. And like I'm watching that. And obviously the refs, I think they went to commercial shortly. Oh, they after. went to commercial. Oh, yeah. boy, did they ever. Yeah. And like obviously the refs checking on him and uh you know, Scorpio's trying to stall, like he's fiddling with the ladder. I think that would have been a great opportunity if maybe she had her wherewithal and maybe a little bit more experience from Tay Conti to get in there and just like somehow get, you know, in Scorpio's face or something. They should have called an audible there. But it was it was kind of awkward watching Scorpio stall for the entire commercial break. But yeah, he ate shit. Sammy did. Right. Now, I, this was this could have been on my list, might have been on my list, whatever. Um, but here's, here's what I want to say. I saw people getting all bent out of shape that they're already switching the title back to Scorpio Sky. Mm. Um, and I've said this before in the show, we as people need to like kind of relearn the way that wrestling can be again. Mm -hmm. Um, obviously if they continue to do a series between Scorpio and Sammy, that's fine. But if the TNT title is like the hot potato title, like so be it. Yeah. You know, if it changes hands like 15 more times in the next 15 weeks, I think that adds to this is a highly contested title, can change hands at any time. And then now once you've built up over the course of maybe like two or three or four, five more title defenses of it flipping back and forth, and then somebody wins it and then they have a defense, everyone's expecting them to lose it and then they don't lose it. You're like, oh, okay, now what? Um, so I'm, if this ends up being the hot potato title, I'm perfectly all right with that. Yeah. I mean, there's a difference between like, I, I think there's a happy medium between the Roman Reigns title reign and like the 24 seven title changes, you know, like, and if this is closer to the 24 seven, that's fine. Uh, I think we're just, a lot of people are used to the way AEW books stuff where like Cody Rhodes had it forever. And then obviously Brody had it briefly and then Cody got it back and like Rusev had it forever. It seems like, or at least compared to Sammy Guevara. But, right. yeah, and, and that's the thing is you have to bear in mind, this is a title that's only been around for two years, not even. And for, for you to say like, Oh, Cody had it forever. It, comparatively um, speaking. Right. I think today, uh, you know, and it's a little bit too new, so I didn't put it in the notes, but today was like the anniversary of what would have been like uh, uh, Darby Allen's ninth title defense of it, you know? Yeah. So nine title defenses, he had it for a while too, but we don't remember Darby even having the title because there's been so many champions since. Yeah. No, I got you. Yeah, I'm I'm fine with the changing time, changing hands, and it needs to be defended on TV only. None of this pay per view defense shit. <laughs> uh, I'm, and that's another thing. I'm okay with that being uh, a TV, like essentially being a TV title that's yeah. only defended on TV. Yeah, but I'm also I'm not going to be one of those sticklers that's like, why isn't the TNT title defended on, or why is it defended on TBS, and why is the TBS title defended on TV, TNT, whatever. But uh, as long as they're just recognized as being television titles, I'm fine with it. Agreed. All right. So I, I sadly got like a little bit more negativity this week than I usually do. Uh oh. Um, you know, and again, if I was a little bit more prepared, maybe I would have had the. Uh, Natural born killers ready to go underneath me. All right. So uh, Becky Lynch uh, had an interview that came out on Tuesday where, amongst many other things, somebody asked her about the AEW women's division. And I don't have the exact quote in front of me, but she essentially said, uh, our women's division is better than AEW's. Uh, and the sad thing is she's kind of not wrong. And I'm talking about main roster. I'm talking about Raw and SmackDown. We'll get to NXT here in just a little bit. Um, I think AEW's women's roster has a ton of potential. But I think they just don't utilize it as much as everyone does. You know, everyone's biggest complaint is 
that you could set your clock to that second to last segment of TV every week, that 930 death slot is always going to be a women's match. Mm. And many times, whether it be episodes of Raw or episodes of, or episodes of Raw, episodes of Dynamite or episodes of Rampage, that the women's segments usually end up drawing more, but there's no real cohesive storylines. And, I, you know, I, I'm not there. I don't work there. I can only go by what a lot of people put out on social media, whether it be people like uh, Kenny Omega, who's currently not there, uh, people like Dustin Rhodes, who work very closely with the women's division. Um, more from a structural standpoint as opposed to a storyline standpoint. But AEW is a relatively new company. It's, you know, just about three years old. Um, they don't run regular house shows. They don't have a performance center. But there's a lot of people working really hard to get there. And I know a lot of people were very upset by those remarks that Becky Lynch made. And I'm not upset by them because I'm not a woman. I'm not a wrestler. I'm not any of these things. But she wasn't, like, saying anything disparaging. She was just saying that we're better. And, like, sadly, she's right, you know? Mm. Um, now, we can get into it a little bit further if you'd like. Um, because then on the flip side that night on NXT 2 Point Glow, uh, a lot of – not WWE themselves, but a lot of their um, – uh, what's the – and, again, I don't want to say paid shills because that's a little bit too on the nose. <laughs> Uh, but like the, the 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 accounts out there, like your uh, Bleacher Reports and your people like that, that are very clearly in the WWE pro, uh, back pocket. They're paid affiliates. <laughs> sure, sure. They were they were putting this huge thing over that on NXT this week in a two hour program, twenty three women were featured, including wrestling in the main event. Now featured is one thing. Featured positively as another. <laughs> um, and that's obviously, you know, buyer beware, whatever. And maybe I'll let you go and then get into something else that came out today from an mm -hmm. interview with someone who was released or let go from WWE. Um, but just because you put a lot of women on TV and you give them 30 second vignettes, um, I, I guess that's not as good as like maybe having like one or two really good matches or even like passable matches or matches where someone doesn't die on your TV. Yeah. Um, NXT at one point had the best women's division in wrestling bar none in North, in North America, best women's division hands down. And that was pre NXT two point glow since NXT two point glow became a thing. It is not the best women's division ever. It's like, I don't even know what the hell it is. Right. Yeah. Um, I saw somebody else tweeted out. It's not my joke. Uh, and I sent it to you in the group chat that NXT two point glow is essentially, uh, Nickelodeon for horny old men, <laughs> you know, with like yeah. day glow colors and booby traps and water guns and <laughs> slime and like relationship stuff and really weird, you know, whatever's. And that's the product that now the one man who runs everything wants. And like I said, we'll maybe get into that a little bit later on in my other thing that I want to talk about. But yeah, I just kind of want to get that out there in regard. I, I, and again, you know, we're going to get to a point where we don't differentiate and say like a oh, women's women's wrestling goes in this special box over here. But as long as like the people who compete in women's wrestling put themselves in that special box while trying to get themselves out of that special box. I have no choice but to, like, remark on it in that way. I don't know sure. if we're comfortable with it. You know, I, I feel – we talked about it here, Mania. I thought um, Becky and Bianca Belair was maybe the best, if not the second best match, all of Mania weekend. And I'm not saying it was the best women's match or it was the best, like, caveat, caveat, whatever. Um, you know, depending on the mood I'm in, it was either that or the Sami Zayn-Johnny uh, Knoxville match, you know? Two mm -hmm. completely different matches. But if you're looking at, like, a technical work rate, storyline, whatever, Becky and Bianca had the best match. Johnny Knoxville and Sammy had the best spectacle of a match. Um, but where I'm getting to all of this is wrestling in general can always be better. And if you ask somebody who works, like, there was no way in hell that Becky was going to say, like, oh, yeah, our division sucks. AEW is better, you know? Yeah. Uh, that's really where I was getting to with all of this. 
Yeah. I mean, a couple things I'll throw in on there. I would agree that if you look at just the main event picture of WWE with your Becky and Bianca and like Charlotte and now Asuka, and maybe one day Alexa Bliss, like their top is better than AEW's top, you know, with Britt Baker and Sheeta, who God knows what they're doing with Sheeta and, you know, Nyla Rose, like the, the top versus the top. I think that there's no comparison. WWE, you know, is better as far as the way women as a whole are presented as being credible wrestlers and athletes. I think AEW does a better job there, you know, and, and the only thing about NXT is, you know, uh, I agree. It was just there was a ton of women on the show, but it was all like people chasing each other around and who's dating who. And other than Cora Jade, I mean, how can you take any of that stuff seriously? Uh, well, maybe Gigi Dolan, because I love the part where she uses her her flower as a shotgun. That's always impressive. But uh, did you but, see her? Uh, was it a week or two ago where she was uh, like the way that she runs away from when uh, uh, Wendy Chu squirted her with the the super soaker? <laughs> Like yeah, in the like most unnatural war. way a human has ever run in their life. <laughs> you take that back. Gigi is good at everything. <laughs> uh huh. But look, just to make it serious again, like it, the top top of WWE women's is presented better, but you know WWE has a long way to go. And I agree. I on this very show for months and months and months we talked about you know whether it be Io Shirai. Or, you know, Raquel Gonzalez, who just disappeared and was replaced by somebody named Raquel Rodriguez. Uh, like, the NXT women were the best. And uh, they stole the show week after week. And, you know, obviously that is not important anymore. Right. But, yeah, it is what it is. I'd like to see there be a balance. Like, WWE needs to treat their lower card women more seriously and less like TNA. And yeah. uh, AEW needs to do a better job of... You know, maybe having storylines, being a little bit more sports entertainery with their women. You know, it's they're both too far on the opposite ends of the spectrum. For sure. All right. My turn. My yes. turn. All right, Joe, I'm just going to talk about real quick the fact that uh, on this past week's Dynamite again, uh, we had. Uh, what is what's his name? Lance Archer fighting Wardlow. And obviously Lance Archer is another paid gun of MJF. And I just want to mention how MJF just does not have a good track record of hiring muscle. You know, whether it be back when he was paying off people to take out Jericho with all the labors of Jericho, you know, whether it be Butcher and the Blade or he brought in Hoovy, Nick Gage. And now we're getting treated this week, apparently, with uh, W. Morrissey, at least if you want to believe the uh, the can't teach that line that MGF threw out there. And uh, maybe MGF just isn't as rich as we think he is. Maybe he's bribing people with like little amounts of money. But I think well, he's MJF, had six figures this week. Yeah, six figures, six, maybe six action figures. Definitely not six figures of dollars. Because I uh, don't know. I I see I see a chase sign to MJF going for a lot of money on whatnot. I'll just say. Uh, well, I just <laughs> want to say MJF needs to empty the bank account. Uh, right. If he wants to take out, uh, if he wants to take out Wardlow, he needs to Joe. <clears throat> he needs to pad the lope. On bringing the Broski? Deathmatch King. <laughs> What'd you say? Bringing Broski? Yeah, bringing the Deathmatch King. Oh, That'd boy. be perfect. Then, uh, I mean, obviously it would derail this Wardlow push because there's no way Wardlow would look big next to Broski, but Yeah, uh, Broski comes <laughs> in all Warlord. And, or, yeah, looking like the Warlord, you know? <laughs> yeah, but I was just thinking about that when they, uh, I'm like, all right, they're bringing in Morrissey of all fucking people to be like his next heater to feed to Wardlow. I was like, isn't there anybody else on that Impact roster that's maybe a free agent that would be maybe willing to whore himself out for a couple bucks on national television? Or to the fact that Cody's not there, just completely burn that bridge. I don't know. But I was just thinking about that, and I figured MJF needs to step things up a notch. Uh, I like your idea of him bringing, bringing in Broski. That would be funny. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, and again, I... I I don't know uh, the former big cast, W. Morrissey, whatever his name is these days, but I will say this. The storyline is that they're bringing guys that are bigger than Wardlow, and Wardlow is supposed to be tall, you know? So yeah. <laughs> uh, you're limited on in, in wrestling. Oh, shit, you know who? The, oh, well, you know, it would kill Wardlow's gimmick as well. Mm. You want to bring in somebody who's big, who could go, 
and maybe also deals and action figures, maybe on a lower scale. Uh, you know, maybe those six figures, you know, maybe just be enough to do an extended daddy daughter weekend, but bring in the boar. <laughs> Yeah, one of those six figures could be a Batista Ultimate. You know, right. so you only have to find five more. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the six figures of the Batista Ultimate, ninety three King of the Ring, Brett Elite. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure he has a wish list of the six that he wants. You know. <laughs> that match would never end though, because obviously AEW wouldn't allow uh, Wardlow to lose, but also the boar would never bump. So it would just be a lot of, like, collar and elbow tie-ups until they both got tired. <laughs> well, listen, I'm sure Tony Khan could mortgage his house one time, two times, three times to come up with the right figure to get bored to bump on national TV. Yeah, I wonder what the Boar's thought is on taking a, a toe drop. <laughs> a drop to hold, you mean? Drop to hold, yeah, I'm sorry. I'd say the Boar's a drop to hold guy. All right, because, you know, maybe that could be the finish rather than a power bump. <laughs> But uh, getting back to defending W. Morrissey, uh, you know, he's rehabbing his image. You know, he went, th- he's another guy who went through a rough patch. Uh, he's kind of made it his deal that, you know, made it public that even though he's an impact now, his goal is probably to get back into WWE. Um, I say, you know, good for him. If this is just like more of his rehabbing image and, you know, like, and this is terrible to say, like, all he did, unfortunately, is, like, hurt himself, like, with, like, drugs and booze and pills and stuff. And he's gotten himself better. But he didn't, like, get behind the wheel of a car and kill someone. Um, you know, he didn't, like, sexually abuse someone. He didn't, like, mentally abuse anyone. So, like, if he's getting himself back on the straight and narrow, then yeah. I'm okay with all this, you know? He didn't do anything that three-quarters of the WWE Hall of Fame didn't do all the time. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so the last bit I want to talk about here, okay? Yep. I thought I was done with complaining about women's wrestling, okay? (laughs) Round two. Round two. Uh, But uh, an interview came out that Chris Van Liet did uh, did with uh, the former Ember Moon Athena. Came out today, right? Okay. And I'm guessing you didn't hear or see or any of this, right? Not a thing. So she gets into a little bit about how uh, stuff was kind of getting flip-flopped with her push on TV. Like she's paired up as a team with Shotzi, and then all of a sudden Shotzi gets called up to SmackDown and is now as a tag team with Tegan Knox, right? Yeah. Then they tell her, okay, we're going to turn you heel. You have a match on NXT on this day. And then the day of it comes, like, okay, now the match is on. Uh, 205 Live, but we're still going to go ahead with a heel turn. We want you to go back to your o- other look. We're going to take you off TV for a couple of weeks so you could dye your hair back to red, get the red context, get new gear. She comes back. They're ready to go. She's on the lineup sheet. And then they just say, you're done. You know, so like a lot of that stuff, but that's nothing new for world wrestling entertainment. Okay. Yeah. Um, Okay. Um, Okay. But then this is what she came up with. Okay. This is also from the interview and I'm reading this verbatim and I quote. Okay. Yep. Um, I remember going to my makeup artist and saying, I'm so unhappy. We would have to sit through these stupid meetings about how we'd have to dress sexy. I remember looking at someone else and laughing. We cater to children. I'm not about to wear fishnet booty butt cheek shorts because we had a two hour meeting about how to dress more like Mandy Rose. That's not fair. Mandy is absolutely phenomenal, an amazing person, but not everyone is Mandy Rose. I started to see this downslope as soon as Triple H was gone. Uh, For the first bit, we didn't know why. We just knew he wasn't there. And I got so angry. I was sitting there thinking I did nothing wrong. I didn't piss Vince off. Um, they take Shotzi away, they take my push away, they take all this other stuff away, um, and she then goes on to say that there were people that were being told that you have to dress this way, and they were saying, like, I'm not comfortable dressing this way, and they were told, it doesn't matter if you're comfortable or not, this is the new direction for the show, you're dressing this way. Mm, Wow. Um, so, you know, uh, going back to... NXT two point glow being 
Nickelodeon for horny adults. Um, yeah, just a bummer that like, and then like people were like doing the digging and there was like this image consultant person who, you know, back in October tweeted out that she was at the performance center, you know, talking about like hair and makeup and costuming and stuff like this. And then people were putting the pieces to the puzzle together that that's what that was. And it's just a shame to see, we mentioned before, NXT had arguably the best women's division in North America. And just in a matter of six months, them just change it into everyone like have your ass hanging out. You know? Yeah. Breaking news. The WWE is a bunch of scumbags. <laughs> right. Um, and like, it's, it's just, it's, it's not that it's not known, but it's another thing for someone who was just recently in the system to come out and say like, this is what they were telling us to do. And yeah, people, were giving, always, people were giving pushback just... and saying like, I'm not comfortable doing this and essentially just being told too bad. Yeah, I was going to say, it's always jarring to hear specifics. Yes. You know, from so, especially firsthand from somebody that was impacted, you know? Not right. like I heard it from a source. Yeah. Wow. No, that's fucking shitty. <sighs> WWE, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> all right. That's all my talking points, Joe. All right. So that's all mine, too. And I think this is a good enough spot to... Well, I got one more. And this is just with kind of a caveat. Um... And again, I, I don't think I, it's a little too early for me to really comment on uh, some recent speaking out allegations that came out because, you know, they're still going on. There's people who have gone through some rough stretches of, you know, whatever with relationships or um, and it's difficult to say only because we're supposed to tr believe the victims, even if the victims are people who align themselves with maybe the worst person in all of wrestling. Um, but because of this all came out, uh, I was reminded to tell a story on the air. And it's a story that I know that I've told on the air recently, but I would be remiss not to tell the story again. Okay. Okay. Uh, this was National Pro Wrestling Day 2013. This was the first one that they did where it was at the Philadelphia uh, National Guard Armory. It was like two shows, an afternoon and a night show. It was all these different promotions and so on and so forth. It was one of the first things that Smart Mark Video streamed live for free. Um, so, and this is when uh, Adam Lash was still involved with Smart Mark Video and everything. And he was running the switcher and like the, str the live streaming deal, right? Okay. Uh, so Adam Lash is a very notorious online shit talker. He doesn't really give a fuck. And one of the people that he had pissed off was Chris Dickinson, who was booked on the show, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and online, Chris Dickinson more or less said that I'm going to come and kick your ass, okay? Uh, so the way that everything was set up was like commentary was like here. The, the hard camera was like right behind me. And then right next to the hard cam was latched with his setup, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm there. I'm going over my notes figuring out who is where and what matches I have and what matches I don't have. And then I see out of the corner of my eye Dickinson coming over this way. Uh, and I'm not going to get up, you know, um, but I want to see what's going to happen. And he goes over to Lash and he kind of like bumps the table on him. And he's like, you want to talk shit now, motherfucker? And Lash goes, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Beat me up in front of everyone? And then you'll have to explain why this free charity show can't happen because <laughs> you got mad somebody made fun of you online. And then Dickinson just like, huh, 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 fuck, and walked away. <laughs> so um, I'll just say, I know a lot of people have their stories about Chris Dickinson. Some good, most bad. Um, I wasn't a fan before then. That cemented me not being a fan of his. Um, again, maybe you've had better experiences with him, but uh, I've had a lot more people that privately tell me about the bad experiences they had with him than publicly defend him, is all. Yeah. Well, to be fair, who hasn't wanted to beat up Adam Lash? Uh, um, listen, <laughs> these days, uh, it's, a, it's a longer list than you'd think. <laughs> 
but that's another thing is I, I will throw this out there to you if you are an independent wrestler and you get that idea in your head that someone's fucking with you on, online and you're like, I'm going to get that motherfucker to show. I know he comes to these shows and I'm going to get him. It never, ever works out well. Ever. Yeah. <laughs> so it's best just to roll with the punches and hope for the best. Yeah. And and I, I don't know what the shit talking was about, like exactly or what it said there. But I mean, I think there's something if you're playing a character, whether it be on TV or in the ring or whatever, I think a certain level of shit talking should be tolerated unless somebody is coming after like your family or yeah. or something like that. Just fucking deal with it. You're. I don't want to say you're a public figure and you should handle everything, but I mean, there's a certain amount that you just have to let slide. And I know I've mentioned this on here before talking about Chris Dickinson is that uh, he he did one of the fake blood sport shows right after GCW broke off their agreement with IWTV with Jerry's mm-hmm. Internet Wrestling Emporium. And they hadn't like solidified their deal with fight. So they were doing their blood, the Chris Dickinson blood sport show and like some sort of like low rent fucking bullshit like streaming thing. Right. And nobody bought it. Tons of people pirated it. Dickinson mm-hmm. went online and bitched and complained and cried about it. And Mike from Virtual Pros, who I mentioned earlier in the show, uh, said, oh, yeah, just like all that Japanese footage that you paid for, right? <laughs> to which Dickinson replied, you didn't have to be mean about it. <laughs> I like that reply. There we go. Yeah. So, hey, let's get into homework, huh? Yeah, hit the jingle. Homework. Homework. It's an obligation you owe your family and yourself. Home, home, homework. Homework. It's an obligation you owe your family and yourself. Ooh, and you know what? I'll throw it in here. Um, as opposed to in the plugs a little bit later on, just cause it's on my mind. All right. Um, word. I, if you remember last week, I texted Jerry of Jerry's internet wrestling Emporium about the live stream for yeah. the LVAC show next week. Okay. Uh, quote, uh, Jer- Jerry, texted me nine in the morning the next day. Um, one of our guys was there last week and it's not good enough to stream live. Their oh. upload, their upload speed is better than their download speed somehow. Uh, Unless they have a separate spot to plug it in, it's not going to be possible. Oh, is there a chance that it gets recorded and then uploaded? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's still happening. Okay. So maybe live the tape. It's just not going to be live. Yeah. All right. Well, people can still watch it just maybe later, you know, the next day or a couple days later. And uh, I also have it on. I also have it on good authority that with the uh, new season of Uncharted Territory that starts next month, mm-hmm. uh, they are very close to Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, which is the home base of micro wrestling. <laughs> uh, listen, there might be a crossover. Is all I'm saying. Oh well, I'm not saying those, it's happening, but it's not out of the possibilities. Those those royalty checks better start coming in. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Where the I'll just I'll, I'll come out of retirement. <laughs> no. Take the trip down to Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. Ah, uh, we'll do it from the compound. We'll, okay, we'll do it from the home base. All right, Joe. Well, anyways, back to the homework. You assigned me a show that I was going to watch anyways, but you assigned me AIW Eyes of the Beast, which aired live on Jerry's Internet Wrestling Emporium. And Joe, I watched this live. Uh, But I started watching around the halfway point. I think I caught the last match before intermission. Okay. uh, I watched the match and then it went to intermission and I watched the rest of it live. And then earlier today, I went back and I watched the rest from the start. So I have extensive notes for the stuff that I watched today. And then I have kind of a foggy memory of the stuff that I watched last week because I didn't take notes. But uh, we'll address that as we go. But I just want to say that in the ultimate heel move of John Thorne, he deprived us, <laughs> us the, the live viewing audience, the people who paid their good hard-earned money to Jerry, they deprived us of a bulking season match. 
Uh, and now I get it. John wants to, you know, help pump up the live gate and kind of ensure that people go and uh, go to the Odeon, go to wherever it is that the AIW performs. Uh, Got to give people incentive to go to the live event, which is where Bulking Season performed. Uh, but we did not get a match on the show proper. So I'm a little hurt by that. Uh, and hopefully that's remedied for the next show. Sure. Well, as we speak, uh, both Dom and Casey Carrington the third are drafting. Uh, I think today's NFL draft day too. It is, but I don't give no craps about college football, so I never understand who it is that they're drafting. So right. what's going on right now? Uh, so Dom and uh, Casey Carrington the third are drafting their uh, Cybernetico teams for the Winchester yeah. show next Thursday. Yeah, I saw a couple of the images going up. Yes. All right. So I'm sure bulking season will be in there. They I know better. I know Dom secretly loves Artie. Just don't tell Artie. <laughs> Good. I mean, if he wants to win, if Dom wants to win, he's got to put them in there. So, all right. So, again, starting with the show proper, uh, Matt Wadsworth and Brian Carson on commentary initially. We have the main event versus 9 to 5. This match was pretty much your, you know, big, strong main event guys bumping around the smaller heels, but the heels using the distraction game, kind of distracting, uh, blah, 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 blah. Who, who's refereeing that? Jake Clemens at the very beginning. Very easily distractible Jake Clemens. <laughs> uh, but uh, this match was fine. Everybody seemed like a little bit of a step off on their 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 moves. You know, there's a little bit of uh, miscommunication at spots. People kind of, I don't know, I don't want to shit on it, but... There's something seemed off with this match. Uh, Nine to five did their thing where the, you know, one of the guys brings out the briefcase. Uh, Clemens goes to take the briefcase, throw it outside the ring while the other guy uses the second briefcase to get the hit and the pin and nine to five gets a a rare win in AIW. Right. So, uh, you know, I obviously haven't got a chance to talk to Thorne about this match in particular Uh, on paper with its positioning and where the two teams are placed. Uh, just to go crazy, I would have had this been like a 30 second squash and have the main event go over. Like the, I don't think the crowd would have expected it, but I will say I like the fake out at the beginning with the, uh, music, uh, Verville, uh, you're saying everybody seemed to step off like Verville strikes. I think I always note that they always look a little suspect. He went to do like a baseball slide and got caught up in the bottom rope. Mm. Uh, it is what it is. Um, yeah. Yeah, not everyone's best performance, but, you know, the crowd was into it. Yeah. All right, so next up, the Duke joins Wadsworth on commentary, and we have Shaza McKenzie versus Jocelyn Navarro. Uh, I, again, because I didn't see the beginning of this show until earlier today, so I I heard some things about this match uh, from around the internet, uh, some not-too-kind words about the match, so I went into it with very low expectations, uh, but I, I don't think it was as bad as what I had heard. Um, I, I will reiterate that I want to see Jocelyn in the ring with big dudes just so she can beat the shit out of them. Uh, uh, Jocelyn Navarro, where she just gets to lay into somebody, is the best form of Navarro. Um, there was a lot of chain wrestling at the beginning and submission attempts that didn't quite go well. Uh, didn't really mesh between the two of them. Uh, and Shaz's strikes were not good. Uh, they looked pretty loose. They looked pretty weak. Um but like I said, Jocelyn, I want to see her in there with guys that she can beat the tar out of. Navarro wins with the Widow's Peak. Um, so this was a bad showcase for Jocelyn, unfortunately. Um, mm-hmm. Sha- Shaza McKenzie may have name value, but name value needs to come with some sort of competency in the ring. Uh, you mentioned uh, her strikes look bad, and that's true. Uh, Shaza McKenzie, also not a drop to hold person like Broski. Uh, there's a deal where Jocelyn gives her a drop to hold into the ropes to like set up for like a six, one, nine type thing. And it's the laziest fucking bump I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. Um, also the reason I say it was a bad thing for Jocelyn is like Jocelyn had to wrestle and move at half speed to keep up with Shaza, who is a very slow moving wrestler. Um, When you have the powerhouse of the match have to slow down, there's something wrong there. Like, there was just, like, little things on, like, Irish whips and reversals and stuff where, like, you could see, like, Jocelyn having to, like, one Mississippi, two Mississippi (laughs) on her steps. Because if she was taking her normal strides, she would have just been fucking, like, outpacing Shaz and, like, wiping her out, you know? Yeah. Um, Yeah. 
I hate shitting on, you know, stuff, but we're seeing it. We're talking about it. It is what it is. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Nathan Zagura joins the Duke on commentary, and we have M Dog Matt Cross, who I don't think I've ever seen before. If I if I have seen him, I don't remember him. I'm certainly not through AIW homework. Uh, versus Derek Dillinger with Ziggy Heim. Uh, as soon as I saw Ziggy come out, I was very very worried uh, as to what Kevin Hellions would say in his review. Uh, oh and this is a good spot to point out that if you did not listen to or watch this show, or even if you did and you want some further context, go check out our buddy Kevin Hellion's at Mask Library blog where he does a good write-up on the show each and every week for show homework. Uh, but he he behaved himself, so kudos to him. <laughs> um, but as I said, I've never seen Tiny Tommaso Ciampa before. Uh, that Aww. was interesting. <laughs> Uh, but like I liked him a lot. So there was a spot where uh, Cross went to do like a moonsault off the top rope and Ziggy went and grabbed his leg and went to crotch him. Uh, and he turned it into a split leg and moonsault, which I thought was a very innovative like counter to uh, outside interference. And towards the end of the match, Cross did a stomp on Derek's chest and almost like in one swoop off of the bounce, uh, he do- goes and hits a splash. So it was uh, a real fun match there. Uh, Derek ends up winning with the sunset flip bomb into the corner, followed by like a Meteora like knee shot in the corner. Uh, I would say that like I've seen Derek Dillinger wrestle a lot and I've enjoyed all of his stuff, but he's always kind of wrestled the intense style, you know, where it's just like you know, throwing Ziggy around the ring and putting people through doors. I think this is the best, quote, wrestling match that I've seen Derek Dillinger wrestle in AIW. Um, And uh, I I will take exception before I throw it on to you that Zagur on commentary said that the director is looking to become the face of the intense division. The face? uh, Exactly. Nobody called him on that. So... (laughs) But yeah, I really like this match. Again, I'd never saw M Dog before, and uh, Dillinger, you know, really turned it up with a, like a pure wrestling match for the most part. Yeah, so uh, I love this match. Uh, it was short. It was like eight minutes, uh, no slowing down, which is how a match like this should be. Um, you know, M Dog has been—he's an old school AIW dude. I think they mentioned on commentary the last time that he was there was maybe like 2017 or 18. Mm-hmm. Um, if we ever get into some older shows where he's more of a regular there, his gr- because they were local at Our Lady of Mar- Mount Carmel, his grandma would come to the shows okay. and always mix it up with whoever he was wrestling with, you know? <laughs> Stunt granny. <laughs> yeah. Um, but M-Dog, like I said, he's been wrestling for like almost 25 years. Uh, he got like prominence as being like a backyarder that was featured on like the talk show circuit of like, is backyard wrestling bad? Uh, he was in the backyard wrestling video game. He was in wrestle society X. He was in Lucha underground. Okay. He was in the stone cold season of tough enough. Huh? All right. Um, but he's, he's wrestled a lot. Like he's a world traveled guy. He's wrestled a ton in Mexico, ton all over the world. And you mentioned about how Derek looked great in this match. I agree. I like the foreshadowing and commentary. That they're just planting the little bit of seeds that if and when the day comes where the titles get split up again, uh, that they're priming Derek to be the uh, intense champion as opposed to the absolute champion. Yeah. All right. Uh, Next up, Wadsworth and the Duke on commentary. We have Jackson Stone versus Dom Guarini, the Bone Collector. Uh, Apparently, Orange Cassidy must have let the patent expire on bringing a bottle of juice to the ring. That's good to see. (laughs) Um, So the match starts off with a lot of like grappling and submission attempts. And I was actively booing at the screen. I want big meaty men slapping meat. Um, There's a point where the the match kind of turns in tone when Stone goes and gives a hook plex to Dom right out into the front row of the crowd. Um, Dom hits three broski boots to a down Stone in the corner. Match basically turns into them beating the shit out of each other which is exactly what i wanted to see eventually we get distraction from brian carson and casey carrington uh stone hits a trap german suplex on dom for for a big win like a surprising win there uh we wonder does uh does stone know that uh carson and carrington are there was he approving of this outside interference and then we find out that he is in fact in cahoots with them he gives them a big hug and and uh they all leave together Yeah, uh, I like their first match that they had um, in Akron. I like this match as well. More of the same. Kept short. It was right around 10 minutes. 
You know, I, I knew coming into this match that Jackson Stone was going to win just because Dom won the first one. We have Jackson Stone win the second one, and then you do a rubber match down the road. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about Carrington and Carson being involved in this, but having them being involved with Jackson Stone is a great way to make sure that Stone is booed and Dom is cheered. Yeah. Yeah, man. I've heard on this other podcast that it doesn't matter what you do in the first match or the second match. is what happens in the third match that matters. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a f- it's a final wrestling place reference. Come on, Joe. Oh. Get with it. I'm a listener. I know you pretend, but uh, anyways, oh uh, this is the point. <laughs> this is the last match that I had seen today. And we're getting into the part of the show that I watched uh, live. So next up, we have uh, Zagura and Brian Carson and Wadsworth on commentary. We have the big match between Tom Haller, PB Smooth, Joshua Bishop, Cap, and Kaplan. I'm sorry. I thought this was the next one that had 75 people. Um, Again, I don't have extensive notes on this because this is what I watched last week without taking notes. But Bishop pins PB Smooth after like a big old elbow shot to the back of the head. Uh, Another match. Uh, This is maybe the longest match on the show outside of the main event, but these are your main event type guys. Any one of these guys could or should be contending against Broski for the title. Mm -hmm. Um, I like all these guys, but anytime JB's in a match, I want JB to win. Anytime Kaplan's in a match, I want Kaplan to win. Um, And I like that outside of the main event, this was really the only match that used doors, because sometimes that'll happen where you'll get like six matches on an eight match card where everyone's using doors. If you keep the limitation of doors to like two matches, one match, two matches at most, it makes the use of the doors special. And this was just another one where it's like just four guys clattering the fuck out of each other. I loved it. Some disgusting chair shots, disgusting bumps, a great match. Yeah. All right. Next up, uncle Chase Burnett, who I've never seen before, but he was rather interesting versus Johnny patch. Versus Wes Barkley versus Chase Oliver versus Mikey Montgomery versus Riley Rose. So this is the one that had 97 people in it. Um, again, this is like a scramble match where everybody's hitting their things and Chase hits a shooting star press on Riley Rose for the win. Uh, yeah, so again, good scrambly type match. Another match that didn't overstay its welcome. I think they kept it around like nine minutes. Um, you know, Wes was the odd man out in this. I love that this is a match where it's essentially a bunch of dudes doing flippy shit and Wes just doing 1998 WCW moves. <laughs> um, you know, like, like just trying to steal the win- the pins from everybody. After yeah, the and he's the baby it. face doing it. Um, <laughs> Ch- Chase Burnett's like an old indie guy. And I say old. Um, he's maybe like late 30s, early 40s the most. He just looks a lot older than he actually is. Yeah. Um, if he was a character who did a Dan the Dad type gimmick, it'd be more believable because he actually looks like someone's dad that he's old and decrepit. Yeah. Uh, but he's like an old like Midwest Beyond guy from like 2006, 2007 ish. He was part of a tag team. I forget what the name of the tag team is, but he's wrestled sporadically. And I think he did one of the Winchester shows recently. And uh, he got over with like everyone in the crowd and everybody in the locker room. So Thorne brought him back for a second time. And uh, Thor- Thorne's a big old school uh, tor- uh, Portland guy where I'll give you three bookings to get over. And if you're not over by the third booking, you're not getting a fourth. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think this is two bookings in and Uncle Chase is over. So you'll probably see a lot more of Uncle Chase uh, in AIW. Um, my heart wanted Wes to win, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, they did a really big – They, I love the fact that they kept putting over – that he had Broski pinned for 10 seconds in a match and the referee was distracted. So he, it's been proven that he could beat Broski. And I loved it. Oh, I love that sort of old school, like stuff that happens on commentary, but Chase Oliver was the right guy to win. (laughs) Yeah. And what's with AIW referees just being very easily distracted, you know, come on, Tom Dunn, get on this, fix this. (laughs) <laughs> all right next up we have the philly and marino experience versus the official tag team of pod van dam members only <laughs> and pme re- retained sorry i don't have any notes for it <laughs> uh i like this match it was worked as a very basic uh you know young upstart baby face team against the and i'd hate to say grizzled but you know the the <laughs> dirty cheating heels team um, you know, everything to lose and nothing to gain from taking this match. 
where, you know, members only can take a lot of big risks. Uh, I like this match. The crowd was super hot for this match. Yeah. All right, Joe. I'm going to take some heat here. And this isn't a bit. I'm not working a bit, I swear. And I'm not trying to pick a fight with Minoru Suzuki. I'm not Ed Cody. I'm not a crazy person. (laughs) All right. So next up, we have Minoru Suzuki versus Isaiah Broner. And Isaiah's awesome. Minoru's great. But I've seen a lot of Minoru Suzuki over the last couple months, you know, whether it be in AIW, AEW, other things that we've watched. And I feel like I've seen everything that Minoru Suzuki can do, and I've seen him do it 20 times. I've seen the Minoru Suzuki match, is what I'm saying, and I'm bored with it. Uh, Isaiah Broner's awesome, uh, but uh, he has to just basically do the Suzuki match, which is just basically just slap each other for 10 minutes. And that's all well and good the first time you see it. It's kind of, it's really impressive. It's sick. But when it's like, all right, who is Minoru Suzuki going to slap a bunch this week. Oh, he's going to do it with Samoa Joe. Great. Oh, he's going to do it with this guy, that guy. He's going to do it with Dom. That's awesome for Dom. But after a certain point, it's like, all right, I've seen this match 10 times. And uh, Suzuki wins with a pile driver. And it was what it was. Uh, I, I I completely understand where you're coming from. Um, I could see people being tired of the Suzuki match. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, th- I'm not going to say that Suzuki needs to go away and learn, learn a new hold because he's not gonna, he does his <laughs> yeah. thing. He does he his thing perfectly. Yeah. Um, but I would say that he definitely needs to maybe go away for a little bit, uh, and then come back when things will be a little bit more special. I don't know how much longer he's got, um, on his American tour here, but like on AEW dark this week, he wrestled QT Marshall and you know. It was the match that yeah. Minoru Suzuki has. It was just with QT Marshall. Yeah. At this point, Minoru Suzuki is the guy who's like, I'm just going to crash on your couch for the weekend. You're like, oh, that's not a problem. We'll have fun. And they just won't leave. <laughs> you know? um, I, I, w- I will say, though, in the microcosm that is AIW, uh, there's a big deal for one of their local guys. Not that they paid another name to come in and have a marquee match of Suzuki versus someone. Isaiah Broner is someone that they've been building up. Uh, the only pinfall that he lost that he took was in a multi-person match. And it was off a fuck up. So to him to lose to Suzuki, I think, helps him just as much as beating Suzuki. Because Suzuki ain't losing unless your name's fucking Samoan Joe. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I like this match. This is, you know, the type of match that I, I have, but, you know, uh, that I like to see. But, you know, maybe uh, we could take a break from them for a little bit. Yeah, exactly. All right, next up, your main event of the evening, your absolute and intense champion, as well as the Impact Digital Media champion and the Internet champion and the NWA World Champion. I'm pretty sure NYWC and some other type of belt that he won this weekend. I've lost track. Uh, what, Cardone, what are Gary, Gary Damron's promotion in West Virginia. Oh, the illustrious West Virginia territory. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Matt Cardona with Chelsea Green versus Doug Basham. Uh, I'm sorry, Josh. Wow. <laughs> Is it Danny Basham? Did I get them confused? My bad. It's Josh All right, Prohibition, it's... you son of a bitch. Josh Prohibition. All right. So obviously pre-match, Broski does just shtick. You know, Chelsea does the all hail the deathmatch king. The crowd obviously hates him, which is just going perfectly to plan. Broski looks over to Josh Prohibition's wife and daughter and suggests to his daughter that she leave the building because he's going to kick his her father's fucking ass. So uh, right off the bat, getting the family involved. AIW is for the family. Um Early in the match, there's an inadvertent eye poke. Um, You know, like it it was unavoidable, but the match just unlogically was turned into a no DQ match. Uh, Broski rips off his shirt, rubs it against his crotch, throws it at Prohibition's wife and daughter. Purely an accident. I'm sure he's going to throw it anywhere, uh, but it just randomly went in their direction. Eventually, you know, this match is all Broski doing his thing. You know, it is what it is. People either love it or hate it. Um... But PME comes out for the distraction. Uh, You know, they're getting involved. And in one of the most egregious no-nos in all of wrestling, a fan jumps the railing, tries to get involved in the match, which in this case was Josh's daughter, Sophia. 
She jumps in the ring, gets between Broski uh, and her father when Broski's about to uh, hit her father with a chair. She goes and kicks Broski in the shin. And Joe, again, I get it. I know I am watching professional wrestling. But when Broski grabs Josh's daughter and goes to put her in the power bomb, I let out an audible gasp. So I was like, no, come on. That's too far. That's- <laughs> like, I, for a moment, just let, just went full, like, like mom in the crowd. I was like this, like, for a moment, I suspended all disbelief. And I was like, don't do it. Don't do it. But Broski goes to lift her up in a power bomb attempt, which was countered into probably one of the best Ranas you'll ever see. Kudos to that young lady. That was awesome. Broski sold it like he just got hit with a fucking, like got shot with a gun. Um, like just a really great spot. Like I've watched that in GIF form and in video form. I've showed that to a bunch of civilians over the last couple of days, um, at, like at work and whatnot. Great spot. Like for all parties involved, I, I can't gush enough about that. Uh, eventually prohibition kicks out of a radio silence. And at that point I was like, no, no, do not, put the stra- do not put the straps on fucking just incredible. Do not do this. Uh, but luckily Chelsea gets involved again. Uh, she just wings a fucking chair at prohibition's head and, <laughs> and a second radio silence is hit. And, uh, we get broski retaining the absolute and intense titles and I will just say before I throw it over to you, uh, obviously, I, I think this is the end of the Prohibition versus Broski storyline. But if we were going to get more of it, I want Sophia to basically turn into a Tyler Fullington <laughs> and basically say she doesn't. I don't love you, Daddy. I love Broski, and that is a future for her. <laughs> that should be her, her heel turn. But uh, I love this main event. If you were watching it for wrestling action, you know, go someplace else. But this was the Broski stick and Sophia's star turn, and uh, a fun main event. Uh, and so for the uh, differing opinion on this match, oh, uh, when you had mentioned before that MJF should bring in uh, Broski to AEW, <laughs> and, it, and I didn't want to tip my hand then because I wanted to save it for here, because uh, yes, because you know to really put w- Wardlow into his pla- into his place, a rambling swear filled promo <laughs> followed by a rambling swear filled promo by his wife. Then a nice lean five minute Memphis stall, and then a bunch of 2010 WWB hot maneuvers. That'll well, re- really ahead. give Wardlow what for. That being <laughs> said, I really like this match. Well, I mean, um, they they brought in Nick Gage to fight Jericho, and I mean, if right. you want to talk about people who can't wrestle, I mean, right there is your number one example. But oh, right. well. <laughs> that that was the last good Nick Gage match. I think Nick Gage. Uh, uh, I think he retired after that match. I'm not really <laughs> sure who this guy they have now is. I like Nikki, but anyway. Yeah. Um. So, uh, like I said, I like this match. The heat is exactly what it was supposed to be. Uh, the opening of the match, you know, you got your Memphis stalling. You got your walk and talk brawl around ringside. Um, you got Chelsea's involvement. That chair that Chelsea threw was super dangerous. <laughs> um, I love the stuff with getting the family involved and the daughter involved. It was a great moment for the crowd. They popped huge for it. It was a ma- moment that went viral, of course. Um, but then from that moment on, like that like last three to four minute stretch was so hot. Like I knew the result watching it, and I still like two of the like two of the cl- the two of the false finishes got me. Yeah. Like, I thought that was the end of the match, and I knew the results, and it still got me. So kudos to all the parties involved in that. Uh, I really thought this was a fun show. Um, You know, I kind of think we shit a little bit on the first two matches, but I say this. If you shave off those first two matches from Derek and M-Dog 20 to the main event, you have, like, almost a perfect card. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it was a really fun show, like... And again, it has its 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 low points at the beginning, but yeah. you know everybody tried hard at the beginning too. So well, maybe everybody but one of them. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, I really enjoyed this show. <clears throat> I, I actually watched the main event again today, even though I had seen it live. Um, I, go and check that out. You know, obviously check out the whole show on Jerry's Internet Wrestling Emporium using the promo code at odds. 
But if you're only going to watch one thing, you know, at least check out the the spot with uh, Prohibition's daughter. I think that was uh, a feel good moment for giving Broski a what for. For sure. So what do you got for me this week? All right, Joe, you knew it was coming. Much like you make me follow the overarching storyline of Chikara, I make you and our listeners, and specifically Kevin Hellions, follow the overarching story of the Nightmare Factory Showcase, the fifth episode of which is available now on YouTube. And it only comes in at an hour 27. So it's uh, they managed yeah. to, I'm sure, cram in a lot of goodness into that hour and a half. But uh, I am excited to find out. No spoilers. I don't know when this was recorded, but I, I hope we get Cody apologizing at the beginning of the show like he does for every one of them. Uh, but we'll see how long that lasts and uh, how many more of these episodes we have left. I but, do... Uh, I do know that this one was filmed uh, like during the contract negotiation. So this would have been filmed like sometime in January, I think. Okay. So this might be uh, one of the last ones to have the, uh, the touch of Cody Rhodes on the, on the students, you know? Oh boy. So we'll see. <laughs> we'll see what happens, but yes, nightmare factory showcase episode five. And it is on YouTube. And this was, this was door number two for you last week, Joe, when you had, Oh, shows. okay. Yeah. It, it wasn't the uh, other um, LVAC show. Nope. It was this or, uh, or the mall madness. Gotcha. All right. All right. So, uh, Hey, let's get into uh phone calls. eh? Yeah, let's do it. All right. Hey, guys. This is Dwayne in Missouri calling in with my weekly SmackDown time. I know everyone just loves this. Uh, had a new record this week. But the question is, high time or low time? So uh, I zipped through all the way to the Gunther match where he took on Teddy Goods with a Z. Uh, after seeing him destroy Joe Alonzo two weeks ago and Teddy Goods this week, I think that man is just unstoppable. Um, but I do want to see Ludwig Kaiser break out into dance like Alex Wright back in the day. I think that would be entertaining. Uh, so from there, I zip forward to the Zia Lee promo, which appears to be a heel turn, I guess. Uh, after that, I uh, tapped into the Sami Zayn um, interaction with the bloodline with Paul Heyman making the best facial expressions ever. And uh, a little bit of his match with um, Drew McIntyre for a total time this week of 17 minutes and 11 seconds. Mm. Yes, I watched it less this week than last week when 40 minutes of it were blocked out by a tornado warning. (laughs) Gotta love it. All right, Um, so Dwayne does call back, so we're going to play his other call, and then we can get into discussion about SmackDown here. Okay. Hey guys, it's Dwayne out in Missouri again. I am still fighting a cold, but I am not coughing as much as I was on the first call, so I apologize, but I rushed it. Uh, you guys are asking for wrestlers with untapped hunk potential. One guy I always thought had potential to have a much different gimmick was Hillbilly Jim. Um, always thought that with a haircut, little beard trim, getting rid of the overalls. He could have pulled off kind of a a Rick Rude, maybe not Rick Rude, but (laughs) something like that. Uh, I had never understood why they didn't change his gimmick, but such is life. Um, Certainly would have kept him from waking up alone. (laughs) That was a nice nice callback. Thank you for your calls, Dwayne. Uh, so what what do you want to tackle from his calls there first? Uh, I will just say I, I was thinking about Dwayne's call when I was watching SmackDown this week. And I, I almost thought about like setting up a camera, uh, at least just facing my TV and, you know, hitting play on SmackDown and seeing how long it would take me to get through. So like I didn't do it. But while I was like fast forwarding through the show, I thought about it. And aside from the Sami Zayn uh, interaction with the bloodline, as he mentioned, I don't think I stopped once. So however long that segment was, like whether it be like four minutes, something like that. And four then, minutes. Yeah. And then however long it takes to fast forward through the two hour show, like maybe add another minute or two, you know, to fast forward. Um, like that's how long it took me. Like I, I could have very easily fit an entire video under six minutes. So I might do that for this next episode of SmackDown. Just set up a, a, a my phone, hit play or hit record and see what happens. 
So I think I got everyone beat this week, or at least uh, we'll see. So I watched the full Drew versus Sammy Lumberjack match, which is about 12 minutes, right? Okay. I watched the full Charlotte and uh, Ronda Rousey uh, contract signing thing, which was another eight minutes because I hate myself. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's. Uh, uh. I watched uh, the Zia Lee promo, which was only 30 seconds, right? About 20 seconds too long. Go ahead. Right. Because she's healed now. She's evil. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I watched the Sami Zayn bloodline thing. I watched the happy Corbin Madcap Moss promo backstage. And uh, because she is uh, really trying hard to get herself canceled on social media, I'm watching the Lacey Evans promos on TV. <laughs> so that's 20, 24, 26, uh, 28 minutes of SmackDown this week for me. Oof. Yeah, no, no thanks. <laughs> hey, if Zia Lee is heel, is she going to have, like, the totally real fireworks and lightning and stuff like that? I don't know. People were speculating that they turned her heel because that cost too much money to do a light show. I, and I think that was just, like, further proof that people are stupid. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure that it don't cost nothing. <laughs> it costs a couple hours, a couple minutes of labor for your production team, but. Exactly. All right. All right. All right, next call. Hello, at odds with wrestling. It is awesome at odds with the exclusive voicemail man Yay. of at odds wrestling. And <laughs> I'm devastated. I'm just so disgusted at what I've witnessed on Twitter, and I'm sure you all noticed it as well. Bear Bronson had the nerve to steal Kodiak, or, or what's his name? What is his name? Something Kodiak. His move. How dare he? I have been watching Kodiak wrestle since today. And I can't believe, to all the ingenuity that he had come up with, that Bear Bronson, who's been wrestling since 2014, maybe longer, decided to steal his move. I don't know how Kodiak's going to sleep. How is he going to support his family? And let alone, what's he going to do now? What is he supposed to do? Nothing. Kodiak, I'm so sorry that your your career has been in shambles and that that your idea of wrestling as a bear creature <laughs> is now gone. I feel for you, Kodiak, and I wish nothing but the best for you. Bear Bronson, shame on you. <laughs> That's really all I have today. Um, but no, in all seriousness, Kodiak, you should probably, I don't know, refigure out your life or something. That's all I have. I hope you guys enjoyed the past AIW show. We'll be seeing you soon. And hashtag bring Joe Sposo back to AIW. <laughs> well, uh, if the way that the boys on Pod Van Dam this week sold uh the live experience and the after party experience uh i think i'll be staying home <laughs> uh sounded like a a very very uh not fun experience so adam did you see this what already talking about this gentleman kodiak who is a coward and has since deleted his tweet <laughs> i only saw it because i saw arthur uh tweet about it and you know i kind of picked up little details but i learned the rest from his uh his great call but, uh, yeah, yes. that's all I saw. <laughs> so there was an account that was tweeting out, like, AEW spots that live in my head, you know? Yeah. And uh, it's a thing of Bear Bronson giving Hook the, you know, the Rikishi driver, greetings from Asbury Park, call it what you will, um, deal to Hook, and then Hook getting up and no-selling it, right? Mm -hmm. So Kodiak uh, quote tweets that tweet out, and listen, I could still get deleted tweets. I know how to do it. I ain't no fucking <laughs> idiot, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but if you delete a tweet, you're a coward, um, especially after you got dunked on so hard yesterday by this. Um, Kodiak says, first he steals my gimmick, then he steals my move. <laughs> Kodiak is a guy who wrestles in the ass end of Texas, has 60 followers, and is a nobody who's done nothing who's been wrestling for four years. And Bear Bronson says, hey, just to clarify, I've been wrestling since 2014. Um, I stole this move from Bam Bam Bigelow, Rikishi, and the rest of my move set from Morishima and Dan Math. Everything in wrestling is, is stolen. If you create something new, people will know. So, like, this would be the equivalent of 
somebody posting a a gif of somebody react somebody on commentary reacting to something mm-hmm. and me quote t- tweeting it out saying like man i can't believe they stole that line from me on commentary <laughs> um and i wish i knew who it was so i could give them the credit for it but it's somebody who's been wrestling for a very long time and it's somebody who i respect very much who had been doing moves or a certain move for a very long time Oh, you know what it was? And now I've just jogged my memory of it, right? Okay. Colin Delaney. For the longest time, Colin was doing that baseball slide German suplex deal. Okay. Where the guy is like, uh, you're like in the 619 position. He baseball slides underneath you. And then as he goes underneath you, he gives you a German suplex. Okay. He'd been doing that for years. I would say at least 10 years he had been doing that move. And then Trent Beretta did it on AEW TV. Colin didn't get mad. Colin just said, it's not my move anymore now. Once somebody does your shit on TV, it's not yours anymore. Okay. And that's what it, and that's, and that's the thing. You could keep doing it, but if they keep doing it on TV and you keep doing it where you're doing it, eventually people are going to say, oh, you're ripping that off from TV. They don't care that you've been doing it for 10 years on the indies. It's just the way that it is. And mm-hmm. Colin still does it from time to time, but it used to be like a linchpin move that he would do. But then Trent start doing it on TV. He's like, well, I can't do it anymore. Yeah. But for this kid to have the hubris to say, this guy stole the move from me. <laughs> I defy you to go and find a match of this kid on YouTube. You can't do it. I tried. So I don't know how Bear Bronson could have even seen a match of this guy to steal this shit from him. <laughs> Well, all of his matches are probably behind paywalls, Joe. It's on like there you go, right? You know, it's on fight. <laughs> oh, but thank you for the call, Artie. Oh, yeah, as always. yeah. I'm looking forward to making sure you're on the next show televised. All right, now uh, next for this next quote unquote call. Uh oh. Hello, Joe. Hello, Adam. This is Justin Summers, and of course, I should be sounding better than regular voicemails. And I don't know if this will be in the voicemail segment or the weekly purchases segment because I want to talk about a weekly purchase that I had. Now, on Wrestling Cheers, I talked about obviously going to AIW, you know, where the homework was this week. Talked about buying a signed Britt Baker micro brawler. And I talked about the meet and greets that I did. But I didn't go into a little bit of a detail of when... I did the meet and greet with Chelsea. I previously met Chelsea before she signed with WWE at an IWC show. She was great. Since then, though, the Major Wrestling Figure podcast started, and I became a fan of that. And all of us that listen to that show and listen to this show, we we have a little phrase, and that's poor Chelsea. Well, (laughs) let me tell you about this meet and greet experience. She was set up at a table right beside Cardona, which I expect. Unfortunately, she didn't accept card. I figured she would because I know Broski does, but that was my fault. Luckily, how sweet of a person she is, I had already went through kind of like the full interaction with everything. And then, oh shit, I have to go to an ATM. And she was really cool about it. And I told her, I'm, I'm not going to screw you over because why the fuck would I do that? But get up to the table. I pull out my figure and my series one major wrestling figure podcast chelsea card i think i've kind of decided i'm going to get all of series one signed and i've already made a pretty good dent in it and that's like not getting the signed version just getting a regular or the other variants and whatever pretty much what i got ever i got in the mail i'm getting signed and the only actual signature i have from that set that i got the signed card was gtd so that makes this set a little bit easier to do but anyway So I pulled these out, I asked to get them signed, and to get a picture with her. Had a picture from when I first met her, but like I said, wasn't an updated one. So she goes to sign the figure, and she uses a paint pen. Well, we got Broski right beside her, and he kind of starts freaking out a little bit about she was about to sign it without testing it. And then like when... She was testing it. She obviously wasn't doing it right. So he kind of freaked out a little bit more, grabbed the paint pen from her, and 
did a proper test with it. Broski makes a joke that Chelsea is going to probably yell at him later tonight about it. So <laughs> move on from that. Finish the signing. I get the picture from her and I tell her that, hey, I'm going to run to the ATM, which was kind of like right around the corner. Pull out the money that I owe her and I'll be right back. But before I do, I tell her that my friends and I have a, a little phrase for her for when she has to put up with Broski shit. And that's poor Chelsea. And you know what? She agreed. She liked it. So, uh, yeah, that was my meet and greet experience with Chelsea and telling her about poor Chelsea. I figured it would be easier to send in an MP3 so the voicemail doesn't cut me off. Well, love you. Love the show. Love you all the times. Later, guys. <laughs> I'm jealous. I want to get a Mark photo with, with poor Chelsea one day. <laughs> and as Justin was telling the uh, story, thank you for calling, quote unquote, in Justin. Um, I as he's talking about the paint pen, I'm like, oh, I can just imagine Broski freaking out over this. <laughs> and there he goes. He tells the story. I'm like, oh my god, he's so predictable, Broski. You know? Yeah. Um, but yeah. So Justin, as he mentioned, he was a little worried that his call would get caught off by the voicemail. And uh, and listen, man, you, you hear the quality of the calls of the people who call in, and that's not a knock on them, but you hear the quality of Justin. I got no problem if you send me an MP3 before nine o'clock on a Thursday and that's your call, quote unquote, for the week. Uh, you know, just makes everything sound better. Yeah, I do have to. And again, great call from Justin. But I have to take Justin to task on something just com uh, unrelated, but related. And uh, he was showing off in the Major Pod Facebook group and other places his signed Britt Baker micro brawler that he got at the AIW show this past week. I don't know if you saw that. Did you see that? I did. And he was talking about, you know, how great of a, a micro brawler and how great it is to, to buy that directly from AIW. And he doesn't question the authenticity of it because obviously Britt had signed a bunch for the organization. But once Justin got the micro brawler in hand, he was publicly campaigning that Thorne raised the price because he feels like he got it for too good of a deal. And that had a very good teacher teacher vibe to it. Like you forgot to give us homework. Like he was trying to jack up the price. What if I wanted to get a signed Britt Baker micro brawler? I'd have to pay more for it. And if that's the case, if one day I'm ever at an AIW show and the desire crosses my mind to buy that Britt Baker micro brawler and Thorne or his minions charges me more, well, Summers, you're covering the difference. So just let it be known right now. So I just wanted, I saw that and I wanted to, to mention that next time I talk to him. And this is as good a spot as any. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many Thorne has left, but I remember, oh, it had to be about a month ago where Britt came to the um, school. The, yeah, the school and like had pictures of her sign and everything. And, you know, obviously Thorne's not going to pull a fast one. He's still very close with Britt. Uh, in many regards, uh, you know, I know he, she helps get a lot of the guys, whether it be the extra work or just tickets in general, whenever they're in that area, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right. All right. Next call. Hey, Adam. Hey, Joe. This is your boy, Kenny from the mystery men. Uh, hope you guys are doing well. Uh, looking forward to uh, seeing you both at the Wirebacker Brewery for the uh, LVAC tremendous event. Uh, should be a good time had by all. I'm looking forward to that. Um, don't really have a question or a comment, but maybe it's uh, more of a suggestion. And uh, I don't even know if this is even the right place for this suggestion, but I'll throw it out here anyway. Uh, friend of the show, Pink Button, our buddy Ed, uh, pitched a show, uh, mm. to Jerry at IWTV about how, uh, Ed will live with one David Bixen fan and they'll do like an odd couple type of thing where, uh, Bix teaches Ed to do a journalism and Ed teaches Bix to do ketamine. <laughs> uh, so for people not familiar, ketamine is a, a horse tranquilizer, I believe. So, uh, here's my suggestion. I don't, I don't, I like what Ed's got going on. It's a good base, it's a good solid base idea. 
but I don't know if ketamine use is going to translate well onto video, because uh, I know every time I've done ketamine, I've just sort of like, you know, sat there and like looked into outer space, and it definitely was not like visually entertaining for anyone else for me to just like sit there in the zone, you know? So like, maybe, maybe Bix does like, uh, you know, some old school ecstasy or like uh, MDMA or Molly, I guess, or, uh, or some real legit like LSD, some acid, just kind of like some proper gel pads or something. I think that might be a little more visually exciting for the home audience of, uh, Ed and Dick do an odd couple. Anyway, uh, see you in the future. <laughs> well, I, w- I want to say, Kenny's on to something, and thank you for the call. Like, why limit yourself to just one drug? I think that could be part of the ongoing theme of the show, is that every episode, uh, Ed tries to introduce Bix to another hallucinogen, you know? Right. I, I like your idea. I like Kenny's idea. Again, thank you for the call, Kenny. Uh, I'm surprised Kenny, of all people, didn't suggest mushrooms. <laughs> That's um, the season finale. That's sweeps oh, week. <laughs> okay. But I think the problem is, no matter what drug it is, Ed knows that he has to get his one out of the way. And Ed's been on a ketamine kick lately, uh, you know, talking about it online. But I think he knows that whatever drug he suggests, um, that... It'll just inevitably end with Bix murdering Ed in his sleep. <laughs> and, and I don't want to yeah. see Bix do a murder. I don't no. want to see Ed die. But this is the inevitability of it. It's not going to be through a cycle of several different drugs. Yeah. And if you listen to Pod Van Dam this week, you know how um, path of least resistance that Ed could be at times. <laughs> And uh, like I said, I just think that if push came to shove, Bix would just end up murdering uh, uh, Ed in his sleep. Yeah. I, all right. I have a, a hypothetical for Ed, and we'll just count this as me calling it to Pod Van Dam, since I don't do that since Jonah banned me. But Ed, <laughs> you can address that this on next week's At Odds or wherever you want to do it. If you had your choice between getting that show with Bix where you live rent-free in New York, but you don't get paid anything extra. It's not like you become like a millionaire from this show. You just live rent-free with Bix and you get to do your drug drug games and all that stuff. Or you have carte blanche. You have your choice of putting any Japanese wrestling you want on Jerry's Internet Wrestling Emporium. Like if any of those shows that you love that only have like three episodes, you know, you could backfill that catalog, get any obscure promotions you want. You get to fully dream book all the Japanese wrestling content on IWTV. Uh, So those are your choices. You get your show with Bix or you get all your Japanese television. I want to see where your loyalty lies. And again, Ed's a wild card, so you never really know what he's going to say with that. You know, and it's not from a lack of trying, because I know Ed got a chance to kind of bend Jerry's ear this past weekend. So I can only imagine (laughs) what was pitched when when the cameras weren't rolling, you know? (laughs) I'm sure, like, Jerry kept on being like, oh, what's that? Oh, hold on, I'm getting a call. (laughs) All right, next call. Hey guys, Kevin here. Uh, so my son just asked who I'm calling, and I said, uh, it's my friends that do a wrestling show, and I have to call to annoy them every week. Mm-hmm. So here I am to annoy you every week. Uh, one, I had a lot going on this week, Hi. so I kind of... Go ahead. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> so I had a lot going on this week, and I kind of took your suggestion and did the WWE shows on YouTube. So I did Raw and SmackDown that way. And gosh, I, I feel like I got like so much of my life back this week, not watching three hours of Raw and two hours of SmackDown. I did watch NXT, though, so I'm not quite recovered yet. Um, also, speaking of people picking on me, like uh, my son, like you guys, and like my friends that I went to the Impact pay-per-view with, you know, they're calling me names for taking all these pictures. I took pictures of all the male wrestlers, too, and maybe a ton of pictures of the female wrestlers, like probably a two to one ratio, five to one ratio, 10 to one ratio. Oh boy. I took a lot of pictures. Um, so I think I need Adam to defend me. Like there's nothing wrong with taking pictures, right? At a show, as long as you take pictures of everyone, no matter what the ratio might be. Adam, I'm hoping you'll defend me. That's all. Bye. Uh, you're on your own, dude. <laughs> 
I always like to take as many pictures as I can, but I like to it's like kind of just I photo bomb stuff. I take as many pictures, you know, and I post them. And sometimes some of the wrestlers, you know, I'll tag them in it and they'll like them and they'll they'll share them. And you know, I feel like I'm doing a service, but uh, none of this this five to one stuff. But I don't know. You're I'm worried about you. <laughs> I'll say it's less. Um how many pictures you're taking and it's more what you're doing with those pictures <laughs> or what the performer is doing in the pictures uh when you're taking it like are these yeah. all like uh you know is it, is this performer happen to be bending over a lot in these pictures i don't know ha huh. yeah <laughs> and hey you know what and i'll throw this out there as well uh you heard kevin's son in the background uh, if you got a kid or if you're into this sort of thing, go subscribe to his kid's YouTube channel. It's Declan, D-E-C-L-A-N space X. Uh, he's been doing like videos of him doing what's called the Nuzlocke. And if you know, you know, on Pokemon Sword and Shield, amongst other things. Uh, so if you're into that, your kid's into that, uh, check his channel out. Uh, you know, Declan's, I think, nine years old. Uh, you know, he's not like coached up or like cooked like <laughs> most of these YouTubers are. Yeah. He's like a real person. Yeah. And, uh, uh Kevin, if you, uh, play this back for Declan, make sure he knows he just got a free ad read. And if he wants another one, he better talk some money. You know? Right. <laughs> uh, so next up, uh, pink button, uh, from a quote, prominent person in wrestling. <laughs> hey, Joe and Adam. This is Ed. Um, so in the group chat this week, we were just kicking around ideas of like PVD Pro were possible. What would, uh, what would we do? And I had an idea of a Posse and Dam versus at odds, uh, six man tag. Mm. Well, probably eight man because I figure all four of us would pick a guy. So yeah, so let's go eight man tag. So if you guys had to pick four, a four. I'm very high. What am I trying to say? For wrestlers, for a team, for ad odds, who would you guys pick? And uh, also, hey, I know last week I was talking with a fake Bell Delphine account, and like that was a joke, but like that fake Bell Delphine account is back because the real Bell Delphine is actually back, Adam. Like she's back. She's, <gasps> she's back on the internet. She's probably going to make content again. What? For art. I called art. So just get excited. You're, you're making jokes last week, but I, I, I need you to know that, like, no, she's really back for real. For how long? I don't know. It's so, like, let's just enjoy it while you can, right? Yes. <laughs> okay, bye. Ed, I, I, I'm not doing a bit here. As soon as you listen to this, I need you to message me with any links. I mean, for, for art purposes. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, so back to what he was saying. And again, I apologize. I'm a little flustered right now. This is this is big news. Um, are we selecting four wrestlers of just like our favorite wrestlers to represent us? Or are we picking people that we can potentially have access to? Like, am I going to have like, you know, my number one pick is the boar and my number two pick is DJ because he's a Haas. And, you know, like, or is it just like, oh, like our favorite wrestlers? So the way I took it was... Um, at least in my mind, it's the four of them. It's Ed, Pat, Brian, and Jonas against yeah, whoever we pick. Yeah, because it's like, okay, those four are wrestling. Now, do we have to be – can you be like – I assume you're going to be our mouthpiece, right? Okay. You're not getting physical, right? I right, Listen, I, you said you said DJ. DJ is almost as broken down as an old man as I am. So <laughs> good luck with getting either one of us in the ring. Uh, so, all right. So it's the four of them. Right versus all right i'm in the match and obviously we've we've proven before that i can easily dispatch ed uh jonas is a little pipsqueak he'd be easy um i i'd be rough i'd be hesitant to to take a shot at pat because he's a good boy and uh the new guy jobber uh i don't know he's the wild card so i would definitely need boar on my side as long as he no longer uh you know is mad at me and oh man Artie. Absolutely Arthur McArthur. So me and him could like, you know, distract the referee with our twin magic. And, uh, uh, you know what? Eddie Kingston's getting in there because just to guarantee that win. So I hope they're getting ready to get beaten down by Eddie Kingston. I'm going to have to have you make a call. That's my team. So, uh, obviously you're saying I'm the mouthpiece. You're a competitor. So I got three picks, right? Yeah. Yeah. I want to win. Okay. 
Yep, fair enough. So here are my picks. Mm-hmm. I'm picking Cole Radrick. Don't know I'm that picking is. Gregory Iron. Oh, geez. and I'm picking Laparka. Oh man, they won't even show up. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Yeah, well done. <laughs> and if and if we're taking you out of the match uh, yeah. to replace you to have a foil for Ed, it would uh, be BMC. And if you know, you know. <laughs> Ed's friend Taryn. Oh. Who was having one online today. Oh, Jesus. Anyway. Yeah. Good call. Uh, thanks, everyone, for the calls. Uh, like I said uh, before, the phone number 570 846 089. Yeah, 0897. But uh, hey, if you want to be like Justin and send me a nice clean recording and we'll pretend it's a phone call, uh, your secret's safe with me, huh? <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely check out uh, RT Public Store, which is linked up through the mothership, Longbox Heroes, tinyurl.com slash Longbox Heroes. 35% sale is still going on this week. Uh, you can get shirts and pins and stickers and notebooks and cell phone covers with uh, at odds inspired designs, amongst many other things. Uh, Adam mentioned earlier, you could sign up for Jerry's Internet Wrestling Emporium. Uh, new subscribers use the code at odds. Uh, if you remain a subscriber, we get a kickback as a referral for sending you there. Uh, and of course, if you also want to help us out, you can make any and all of your purchases through our Amazon click through affiliate link. It's in the show notes to every single one of these episodes. Uh, I say go to your family's computers and replace their Amazon link with our affiliate link. That sounds perfectly reasonable. That's right. Yep. Uh, it doesn't cost you anything extra. They call it an advertising fee. I call it the thing that makes Adam happy at the end of the month when he gets his cut of the fucking money. Yeah. Some of the notable purchases to the Amazon click through this week include, and I know Adam enjoys this. <laughs> uh, somebody purchased a summer cotton linen shirt for men, vintage short sleeve shirt, button down Hawaiian shirt, relaxed fit, casual beach top. <laughs> Nice. Uh, somebody also purchased waterproof fake wasp hornet nest decoy hanging bee deterrent <laughs> fake cloth wasp nest bee decoy deterrent for home and garden outdoors. Orange, four pieces. Yes, <laughs> that was all included in there twice in the one description. The word deterrent was in there twice, so you know right. it really is a deterrent. <laughs> Uh, and someone who I know because they posted a picture of it purchased a Yo-Yo King spin control metal Yo-Yo with narrow responsive and wide responsive C-bearing and extra Yo-Yo string. Ooh. Are they going to walk the dog, Joe? Are they going to something in the cradle? They're going to they're going to be the gr- the the touring or they're going to be the next uh, smother smothers brothers. They're going to play the guitar while playing the yo-yo. Do you play the yo-yo? I don't know what the fuck you do with a yo-yo. <laughs> you yo, right? Yo-yo. Yeah. I had so a yo-yo thanks- once. <laughs> oh, so <laughs> thanks to anyone and everyone for their purchases, whether it be this week, this month, this year, or whenever. Yeah. All right, Joe. Well, speaking of things that you should yo, uh, here's some podcasts to go listen to. That's the worst segue in the history of segues. Yes. And those podcasts are Longbox Heroes, Longbox Heroes, After Dark, We Need Wrestling, Hit My Music, Final Wrestling Place, Porch Talk, Viewer's Choice, WWE War, Wrestling Cheers, IWTV Guide, Pod Van Dam, Hellions Talks, Wings on Wings, and between the sheets. And Joe, I, I know you were clamoring for an update as to whether or not I was going to ever mention the A show on this podcast again. And that's a definitive no. I will not be mentioning the A show. I listened to a recent episode. I'm trying to get caught up. And on a recent episode, somebody, one of the drafters, I don't know who, they're all interchangeable other than Jenna. She did a great job. Uh, I'm sorry, they did a great job. And there was a, a competitor who tried drafting just a belt 
And that person got admonished by Matt Durline that saying that that was against the rules. You cannot draft just a belt. Well, here's the thing, Joe. I've listened to every episode of the A show because I want to know my enemy better. And in the past, Matt has allowed people to draft just belts. So once again, the people running the A show don't know their own show. It's chaos. And I will not plug the A show. So no plug for the A show. All right. <laughs> uh, so we mentioned it earlier as well. Next Friday is Bash of the Brewery, LVAC, uh, Weyerbacher Brewing in Easton. So, 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 so sold out NWO style. Uh, I think if you go knock on uh, Avery Good's door, he might have a couple tickets left over. Uh, you could take your chances by showing up to see what standing room is left, but I wouldn't take my chances. I have a feeling it'll be up on Jerry's Internet Wrestling Emporium shortly after it will not be streamed live. We did have some more matches announced. Uh, World Famous CB is taking on one of his students, My Young Jay Lee. Uh, I think uh, CB is going to be on AEW Dark this week. So that's a nice little promotion for that. Uh, and I'll have to go back and look through my notes. Uh, as the LVAC folks say that this is their the first ever three-way dance that they're having. Uh, as Skyler takes on uh, Veda Scott and Vita Von Starr. There's a bunch of other people that were announced that there hasn't been a match yet announced for it yet i have a feeling that this may end up being the biggest lvac show of all time i'm excited i'm looking forward to it i haven't commentated professional wrestling matches in about six months so i'm gonna be horrible get ready <laughs> now joe let, let me try this again if you would <clears throat> excuse me clear my throat uh at the wirebacher arena joe there's going to be over 10,000 people there to watch Abby Jane versus Avery Good. The Weyerbacher Brewery doesn't hold 10,000 people. It will that night. Thank you. There you go. Yay. I did it. Put applause in there. Thank you. <laughs> uh, already doing too much work. And it's now time for this. Some might cost a little. Some might cost a lot. But I'm the $100 Vansky. And your figures will be bought. <laughs> all right, Joe. I know I say it all the time, but uh, this might be the start of the year of financial responsibility <laughs> and in no way having anything to do with me being uh recently released from my importer exporter job but i don't have a lot of purchases this week i have a couple stories i want to tell though and uh of, of things that have happened to me in my attempts to make purchases but uh i only have a couple things that i bought so uh, i hope that you have lots and lots and lots of stuff to fill this segment up with uh, I don't. Oh, man. All right. Well, I just want to say first things first that I was on Facebook a couple days ago and just scrolling through and in the Major Wrestling Figure Podcast Facebook group, somebody posted a picture of the Target exclusive Ultimate Edition Batista figure with the caption, does anybody still need this? So I look, I think it was posted like a minute or two before. Uh, you know, before I saw it, I clicked on the comments and somebody tagged Mark Sterling in it and Mark Sterling, smart Mark replied, uh, hold on, I'm trying to get it here. Um, uh, something to the effect of I, I got it this morning. And then I commented next. Yes. As in, yes, I'm interested in it or yes, I still need it. Uh, how much or what's your cost? So Obviously, I don't need it. I already have it, but I am on a quest to make sure that all of our, our good brothers that are in need of it that maybe aren't in the Facebook group, I want to make sure that they get it. So I would have tried to, to broker a deal, you know, reasonable enough. Um, obviously, after I put in that, you know, I was interested, like 30 other people tried claiming it as well, but I was first. Um, and then the seller basically says to Mark, you know, Mark had said, oh, I got it this morning. The guy comments, the seller comments, 
oh, uh, yes, I have it in hand. Like, not understanding at all what Marky had said. Yes. And, yeah. the, and then underneath it says, I'm DMing you. <laughs> meaning he's DMing Mark Sterling. And again, Mark Sterling said, I got it this morning, as in, I'm good, no thanks, you know? So I politely messaged the seller, and I was like, hey, man, uh, I was the first claim on that Batista. Uh, I'm pretty sure Marky already has it, but, uh, you know, let me know what you're looking for, you know, on the figure. And he replies back pretty quickly. He's like, yeah, I want to give Marky first cracks at it, you know, whatever. If I don't hear from him or if he says he has it, I'll let you know. And this is at like, I don't know, five o'clock at night, six o'clock at night on a, on a, you know, one day. I never hear back from this guy. I think I have a feeling that this guy was like really desperate to be able to say that he sold something to Mark Sterling or whatever. Yeah, he, it sounds like he definitely wanted to have that interaction. Yeah, yeah, and that's fine. I mean, we've all been there. You know, some of us have been pilled in the past. I get it. <laughs> you know? In the past, huh? Yeah, in the past. Uh, so I never hear back from the guy, but I, I message, I was actually trying to hook up, uh, uh, trying to hook up Marcus with this. So I messaged Marcus and I was like, hey, this is what's going on. You know, would you be fine with, and in my mind, I'm thinking if a $20 figure that's still on the pegs, it has a rule of 35 shipped, a $30 ultimate should be like 45 shipped or 47, something to that effect. So, so I, I messaged Marcus like, hey, would you be cool with this? Do you want it for that price? And, you know, he's like, yeah, no problem. And I figured if he didn't get back to me, somebody else would have. You know, a lot of our friends want that figure. So the seller never gets back to me. The next day, and the funny thing is I'm actually walking into a Target. He messages me, hey, are you still interested in that Batista? So I don't respond to the message because I want to walk into Target and make sure that there wasn't a stack of them in there. Uh, there, of course, wasn't. So I get outside and I'm like, yeah, I'm interested. You know, what are you looking for? You know, and he messages me back, Joe. Well, it's a 60 to $70 figure all day on eBay. <sighs> so I say to him, sure it is. So what do you want? And he's like, I don't know, 65. And I, and I very politely, I was like, nah, dude, I'm good. Uh, you know, offer to the next person in the group. And he's like, well, why? What were you expecting to pay? And I, I I try to explain to him, like, without losing my temper, that I'm like, hey, man, I was like, if you're looking to, like, get rich off of selling these figures, I respect the hustle. Go do it on eBay. But, like, if you do it in the Facebook group, you're not going to have many people biting on it, you know? Uh, but I never heard back from him. But, like, just the fact that the guy was trying to more than double his money off of it, uh, off of something that was, like, currently on the pegs, uh, Kind of, Aren't kind you of got, isn't the Facebook group just supposed to be a friendly group where everyone gives each other these friends at little to no increase in price and maybe even at a hit in price? It's a brotherhood, Joe. It's, it's a, a brotherhood. That's what it was. Yeah, a brother. yeah. It's a tight knit community where everybody just makes sure that everybody gets what they want. You know, it's the it's a toy friendship, I hear, you know. <laughs> but yeah, it was just funny that like clearly this is just I, I don't know. The guy must have been new, but like I, I had one in my grasp, but I'm not looking to if I want to pay like more than double, I'll just go on eBay, you know? Yeah. And I've been seeing a lot of people posting that they've been finding them out in the wild. So I even went to my local Target on Tuesday yeah. just to give it a check and they didn't have them. But what's the elite set that has the uh, the mean Mark Callis and the chaps like the WCW mean Mark Callis? Yeah, uh, the Elite Legends series, you know, the that has there's a China and a Road Dog. And yeah, an so edge. whatever set that is, they had the, those out, like they had the full set. Oh, you should have looked for that red pants edge. That's the chase. Uh, that, you know what? I didn't. I looked, and I wouldn't have known because, um, they don't have the sticker on them. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So Fair there enough. was an edge. I don't remember what color pants he had, but if he had a sticker on him, I would have grabbed him. You know. Yeah, and you didn't buy it? Y'all don't like Edge? No, I don't like it. Well, again, <laughs> Edge should thank his lucky stars for all the, the shit that WWE pulled with their women's division this week because I had a lean 15 minutes on him for this week. <laughs> oh, fair enough. All right, and I have one other complaint of something. Not really a complaint, but a, a story. Did I play uh, the wrong jingle before this? No, 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 no. I had, Maybe I have something for that later, but uh, this is just another story of my collecting woes. And uh, a couple weeks ago, I well, more like closer to a month ago, I was at our local comic shop perusing the toy section, as I'm known to do. And they had 
uh, DC Direct or DC Collectibles, whatever the line was, a uh, Constantine figure, John Constantine. And it was based on the comics. I think it was from like Justice League Dark or something like that. And I was like, okay. I was like, oh, this is cool. I don't have a Constantine figure. But I thought to myself, I was like, you know what? If I wanted to get a Constantine figure, I would probably want the one from like Legends. I'd want the, the CW verse, you know? So while I was there, I looked on eBay and found out that there was... Uh, a Constantine figure based on the Matt Ryan, you know, the, the, that version from, yeah, Arrow, the t- you know, flash, the whatever. TV, yeah. Before the TV show got canceled and they shuffled them off to the other. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a version of that. And so I look on eBay, there's a couple that are like, buy it now for like 70 bucks, but I look at completed listings and they usually go for like 30 to 40 bucks. So I was like, okay, I'll wait. Um, a couple days later, one of them is on auction about to end a pretty minty box. And I end up winning it for like 38 bucks. So not bad. Uh, but for whatever reason, I never included it in my weekly purchases, Joe, because I got like a vibe that like something was amiss with the seller. Um, so I, I look at his feedback. He has like maybe a couple hundred positives and like one negative. And the negative was somebody bitching about like something taking too long to get shipped. So I'm like, all right, whatever. One out of like a hundred is not a bad deal. A couple hundred is not a bad deal. But, uh, I, the guy I buy, I pay for the item seconds after I win the auction as any non-sociopath should do. Exactly. Yep. And you know, the next day it's not shipped or, or marked as shipped or no like shipping label created the next day, nothing, the next day, nothing, the next day, nothing, the next day, nothing, Joe. So I'm like, Oh, I'm starting to get pissed off. So I messaged the seller and I'm like, Hey man, uh, can I get a tracking number on this figure? You know, that's usually enough to, to get people to, you know, get off their ass. No response. So next day, there's no ship. The next day, there's no ship. So I start looking, okay, I'm going to go and click on the eBay thing that says, where's my item? And the problem with eBay, Joe, is if you as a seller list a handling time of a month, then me as the buyer, I can't do anything with eBay until that month has passed. So, for example, me as a seller, I always put, like, handling time three business days. Yeah. So, like, if if somebody buys something off of me and I don't ship it within three days, they can go and open a claim. Right. This this guy put a two-week handling time. Okay. So, that's not, like, a two-week arrival time, but it normally ships within two weeks. And I didn't notice this, so shame on me. Right. So, I sit there and I wait two weeks. For this guy to ship this figure. And I'm just looking at the eBay thing where it says like you have to wait until April like 19th to open a claim. And it's like April 16th. And I'm like, damn it. <laughs> April 17th. I'm like, motherfucker. And that's like April 18th. So literally the day before I can open a claim, this guy ships it. I'm like, you motherfucker. All right. Well, he shipped it. I'm just guess what, buddy? You've earned negative or you've earned neutral feedback <laughs> in oh, my mind. Boy. I'm thinking that, right? So it's coming from like Las Vegas, makes its way across the country, you know, in like a couple days. No big deal. I'm at the importer exporter business, just fucking off because fuck that place. <laughs> my <laughs> ring doorbell, my ring doorbell thing tells me that there's a package being delivered. So I go check the video, check in on my best friend, my my postal carrier, and I see my postal carrier very gently placed down a padded Manila envelope, Joe. Oh no. So I'm steaming. I get home. I look at the thing. It it is that package. It's that Constantine boxed figure, you know, relatively rare, relatively expensive figure that's mailed in a fucking bubble envelope like it was shipped by Walmart. So this is it it keeps getting better. So me, I I maybe take the figure and I fucking spike it out of anger. (laughs) And then I open it up. And once you know it, Joe. This figure is almost passable to the loop test, <laughs> except for a corner of it that I may or may not have caused by my spiking of the figure. Um, but anyways, regardless, I still opened up a claim and said, hey, it was it was shipped in an envelope because I took a picture before I opened it. And I was like, I would like to return this because fuck this guy. Uh, and he has since ignored my res- my messages to return it. Uh, but jokes on him. Uh, buyer guarantees on eBay. I will be getting my money back in full 
uh, I believe in a day or two from eBay. So, uh, yeah, that's about it. That's my story of me trying to get a Constantine figure from the worst fucking seller on the planet. And he will be getting negative feedback now since he's ignoring my my return requests and he sent it in a bubble envelope. I haven't bought anything off eBay in quite a while, I think. Yeah. And I think that's uh, for the best, you know? <laughs> yeah, like I said, it's at the end of the day, as a buyer, you're fine. You know, but uh, as oh, a- you know what? And like, like a like a fucking idiot. I, I look here. The last thing that I bought was the uh, Eddie Kingston micro brawler just a few weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, way way back two weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, Joseph- oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, and then like I had my uh, the Bib Fortuna things, which we're gonna get back into here shortly. You know. Yeah. Just uh, <laughs> I need to stay. I need to stay more ahead on bills than anything else. You know. Yeah. Fair enough. All right. What about you, Joe? Have you bought anything? Uh, yeah, so, uh, recently, um, who's the company that puts them out? Uh, it has to be, who does the Marvel Legends figures? Uh, Hasbro. Hasbro. No, uh, yes, Hasbro. Hasbro, okay. Uh, so they announced that they were doing a line where they kind of look like the old retro figures, you know? Yeah, And they've done a couple lines of them. I've seen them out and about. And I'm like, nah, I don't really need to bite on them. You know, it's whatever. They always do like a mix. There'll be like an X-Men character, an Avengers character, uh, an assorted character, and a Spider-Man character. And I'm like, ah, whatever, you know? Mm-hmm. So then I see that they announce a line where they're going to do uh, Norman Osborn Green Goblin, right? Okay. So I'm like, I love Green Goblin. He's my second favorite uh, Spider-Man villain after... Uh, Dr. Octopus. All right, I'll put it on my list. It says that it's not coming out till September. I can kind of sit on it. Let me look at the rest of them. I'm like, okay, there's a plain clothes regular Spider Man, there's a Venom, there's a black suit Spider Man, there's an Electro. I'm like, okay, even if I get them all, I'm not getting them all. This ain't too bad. Well, uh, like I said, it's supposed to not come out till September. We talked last week um, how. Folks who purchased the client figure from the Mandalorian off Amazon already got their figures where people who purchased them directly from Hasbro uh, still have not received anything yet. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So while my co-host over on uh, Longbox Heroes, Todd, is gallivanting around New York City last week, (laughs) he finds that set, the Norman Osborn set on pegs at a comic shop. Right. Yeah. So he sends me a thing. He's like, you want it? I go, four months before it's supposed to come out, five months before it come out. Let's grab it, you know? Yeah. Um. So he grabbed it. He has his full run uh, of the Fantastic Four. Uh, I paid him for the Norman Osborn, but we passed in the night where uh, he was at the comic shop when I wasn't there. And then my wife was uptown. So she went and got my comics for me. So it's paid for. I just don't have it in hand. I know next week I'll be picking up the Electro one, which our comic store does have the Electro one. Okay. So like I said, I'll be getting those two. Eventually I'll get Venom and regular clothes Spidey. That'll be like another 50 bucks. Uh, And then I'll have the full, you know, Spidey run that I need of those figures. But yeah, that's the only thing I got this week. Nice. Okay, cool. Uh, those, those small three and three quarter figures are very addicting and I'm glad that aside from a couple Mandalorians, I've been able to stay out of them, you know? Yeah. And like, I like how Todd's like, Oh, I got the fantastic four. They do a Dr. Doom and that's all I need. Whereas with me, I could be like, Oh, I can get Spidey and I can get his villains and that's all I need. Yeah. All right. A uh, couple other little real quick things, because again, it is the year of financial responsibility, but I checked uh, in on a live stream on whatnot of one of the people in the major pod group was up on whatnot. And I was just like, all right, I'm going to just kind of peruse. I had nothing going on. And there were a couple things on there that I was a little interested in. And it was, I was like, depending on the price, but I was also in the downtime kind of like checking prices of like resale value because at my core, I'm a dirty flipper. <laughs> and, uh, the seller was listing everything starting at a dollar. And there was this lot of just random, like he did a lot of lots of random junk where it was like, here's like 
a, an Iron Man lot of like a, a lanyard, a pin, a sticker, and like a, you know a little figurine type deal, or you know here's a couple build a figure legs and whatnot. Um, but like one of the things he had listed was, are you familiar with the the brand Fig Pin? Yeah. Yeah, they're like a collectible, I use that term loosely, brand of pins. Uh, you know, there's licenses, kind of like Funko Pop. There's Marvel ones, there's Star Wars ones, whatever. So one of the lots that he was selling had like a bunch of, again, Iron Man junk in it, you know, and a one of 1,000 gold Iron Man fig pin. And again, I was just checking eBay and like completed sales of this fig pin were bet- go- between like 60 to 70 bucks. And I don't know no fig pins. I'm not exactly a person with his finger on the pulse of them. Um, but, you know, he put it up and I ended up winning the lot for like $4 plus like $4 shipping. So I was like, eh, all right, whatever. I'll roll the dice. I'll throw that thing up on eBay and see what happens. But I was just kind of killing time until one of the other items that I was interested in pops up. But here's the thing I didn't know about what not is if you win an auction at, and you pay the full shipping price of the first item, every other item you win is just a dollar additional shipping. Ooh. And the first item that I won, because it was just like a handful of like real small stuff, like I said, it was only $4 shipping. The other item I was looking at is rather large. And if I had bought that on its own, the shipping would have been like 15, 16 bucks. But because I bought those pins, it was like a, it was a dollar extra. So the thing that I really wanted and I ended up winning for half of what it goes for retail. Uh, are you familiar with the Marvel select line of figures? They're the ones that are in the giant square boxes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like if you go to our comic shop, they're kind of in the corner back by like the glass cases. Um, okay. Okay. But yeah, this is a Marvel Select Disney Store exclusive Winter Soldier figure. And it's based on like the uh, like the Brewbreaker uh, Epting or Epsing uh, Winter Soldier, like the comic book Winter Soldier. Yeah, yeah. So uh, basically those things retail like brand new 40 bucks. I ended up winning it for like, I want to say like 19 bucks plus a dollar shipping. So and it was a dollar shipping because I won that stupid fig pen thing. So like all in all, I spent like 30 bucks. And I really just wanted the Winter Soldier figure. And if I had won that for 30, I would have been happy. You know what I'm saying? But right. meanwhile, I have the the one of 1,000 Iron Man fig pin opportunity going. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's uh, that was my whatnot experience for the week. And uh, I am getting sick and tired of whatnot because every time I go on there, it's all these people running fucking grab bag scams. Have you seen this or heard about this? No, I'm not a whatnot person. Yeah. Literally, like three out of every four whatnot sellers is running the are running this nonsense where it's like, all right, bid on this opportunity to spin a wheel, or you get to whoever wins this, you get to pick a mystery bag. All right, person, you won. You know, we bid this mystery bag up to you know eighty dollars. Now you're gonna open your mystery bag. Oh, I'm sorry, it's a ten dollar Funko. Like they're all running these carnival games, and it's so annoying. I just want to fucking bid on shit, you know. And everybody's got these opportunities. Or like, I swear to Christ, I saw somebody playing Plinko, where it was like you were basically gambling on like a spot on like Plinko. It was, it's getting out of hand. So well, uh, everybody's it's, trying to have their like own little like gimmick with it. I get it, but. Uh, I don't know. Maybe. Well, I don't know. You, you, you guys. <laughs> I know. Uh, Brett and DJ are big whatnot guys as well. Uh, I'm fine going to sleep. You know. <laughs> yeah. No, I. Well, I don't want to. I. Uh, I'll tell you off air. Go ahead. Well, fair enough. All right. All right, Joe. The only other thing I have, and really the only wrestling purchase I made all week, because we are in the year of financial responsibility. And this is mostly because I found it in the wild and I would not be willing to spend a dollar over retail on it. But I found uh, in uh, Walmart the Walmart Superstars Remco Bray Wyatt figure. Oh, okay. The Mad Hatter Bray Wyatt figure. Uh, They also had a honky tonk there, but I passed on the honky tonk. Um, And uh, I bought the Bray Wyatt and it is also unpunched and and pretty minty. And... uh, I was like, yeah, what the hell? It's, it's such a weird oddball figure. 
Uh, and I am still on the, on the hunt for the uh, for the Hulk Hogan. I would buy that if I found it. But uh, my only wrestling purchase this week is the uh, Superstars Ramco. I know there was a, co- a while ago the flares were kind of plentiful out there. Yeah, yeah. I remember I was like, oh, I'm going to buy this to as a coupon. Uh, yeah, that didn't work out. I think I might just return it. I still have the receipt. But uh, that's all I got for weekly purchases, Joe. As I said, mostly uh, mostly fumbles and incomplete purchases and uh, a couple opportunities. But uh, I think it's it's a light week, and it might be a light year or just a light future altogether, Joe, because – I don't know about you, but I'm pretty pissed off about something. All heat, no heat. Oh, it's been a week since we got a chance to play this. So, uh, oh, dust it off. What What's going on, Adam? Joe. I think I, I know you're going to know where I'm going to go with this because I clued you in on this in the group chat the other day. And I, w- I was getting mad then, but the more and more I dig into it, and I don't care if the, the major pod boys went and quote unquote broke the story on their podcast. Our group chat was first, Joe. I was angry before them. <laughs> and that is the fact that more and more figures are ditching the plastic windows in the front, like the box, the, so you could see the figure. God forbid you want to see what you're fucking buying. But it started off with little kitty toys. And who cares about little kitty toys, Joe? But they're coming for my Marvel Legends. And it's, it's not a big deal. I don't buy a lot of Marvel Legends. I buy a couple here and there. I can live with it if they don't have windows on the front of the boxes. But I notice it permeating into my Transformers, Joe. And that's making, yeah. making me real angry. And through my research on this, I find out that by the year 2024, all plastic windows on the quote unquote disposable packaging needs to be gotten rid of. And they're going to go to like freaking as as our buddy Kevin Ford said, like cereal box packaging. Fuck that. Like if every single package is going to hide the figure that's inside of it uh, because, oh, they're just going to rip it open. No, not all of us are savages that rip open their goddamn toys and put them on shelves. Some of us are fancy gentlemen who like to keep the stuff on the shelf looking pretty and holding its value. But you're going to be like, oh, we need to save the environment. Fuck the environment. There's better things to go after. You know, don't come after my dolls. All right. (laughs) Like, seriously, like these are. I get it if you're going to cover like a basic, throw a basic in a goddamn shoebox. I don't care, but you're going to go and turn like ultimate edition figures and, and hide the, hide the figure or worse yet, you're going to go and make it so that like people can get their greasy little fingers on it by just having the the figure exposed in the front. Nah, I'm not doing that. If this is the case where like in a couple years, all of the figures are just going to be like obscured inside of a regular box. I might not collect anymore. Like I'm at the very least, I might very, very, very like cut down what I buy because like right now I buy, like I I'll buy like Marvel legends figures or I'll buy McFarlane figures or I'll buy, you know, wrestling figures. If they get to the point where it's like, you can't even see the figure and like, it's no longer this piece of art that you could put on a shelf. I might just collect like the top 1% of, like the people that I really collect, you know, like I might just be like, all right, I'm just going to buy, you know, the orange Cassidy figures, but I'm going to pass on all the other AEW figures, or I'm just going to buy Alexa bliss. And I'm going to pass on all the other WWE figures because like that's half of the appeal for somebody that's a mint in box collector is being able to, I don't know, see the fucking figure. And I get it. It's, you know, it's not like it's Hasbro or Mattel's or Jazzwares decision. It's being imposed on them by, by like, you know, government restrictions, but like, I think there's bigger fish to fry. If you're going to go after people that are, you know, doing shit to fuck with the environment than toy manufacturers, you know, like I'm sure I can name off the top of my head, you know, five more pollutable industries or industries that pollute way more than the toy industry. Uh, so it's bullshit and it's going to affect my collecting going forward. And I hate it. I hate all of it. As a mint and box collector, it's not affecting me just yet. Um, 
so I get what you're saying that it should go to basics, but basics are a little bit more basic. But I would say the plastic that goes around a basic type figure. And again, we're not talking about, you know, just world wrestling entertainment figures or whatever, but the amount of plastic that goes around a basic figure on a flat card isn't that more plastic than the plastic that you would get for like a normal elite or AEW figure? I mean, I have no idea. I've never sat in like measured or anything, but I could say right, it's, probably, right. it's probably a comparable amount of plastic. You know, if anything, a basic has probably thicker, more rigid plastic. Cause it's, you know, a form it's like a bubble, you know, versus one thin sheet in the front so, window of an, of an elite. As much as so as much as this is a thing going forward, at least over the next two years, that that's going to be what the industry uh, is going to be. Um, what was I going to say? Um, I'm sure once they see their bottom line that less people are buying figures because of it, they'll probably go back to it. So we're going to have a period of about six months where all figures are lined up this way. And then once they get those quarterly reports to see how much of a decrease in the in the sales have been, they're going to go back to it. But what if they don't have a choice to go back? Like, like if it is truly a government mandate, will they have the choice, bottom line, be damned to go back? They're going to figure out something. I mean, I hope they're, so. <laughs> they're not going to take that big of a hit. If they, if they take that big of a hit, they're not going to continue to take that big of a hit. They're going to make some sort of lobby. They're going to make some sort of concession. They're going to figure out something to get around it. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking, like, obviously they talked about this on the, the major pod, but I was thinking about, like, Funko Pops. You know, that's – I get it. It's not something you care about, but it's a pretty big industry, and that's all based on, you know, being in a square box where you can see the – not only see the Funko, and I would dare say that the majority, maybe not all, but I'd say, like, more than half of Funko Pop collectors keep them in the box, you know, because the box is part of the presentation. You can't exactly play with Funkos. Right. And, uh, you know, half of the pe- the appeal of collecting Funkos is the exclusive stickers and the stickers go on the window, you know. So it's like if Funkos all of a sudden went to just square boxes where you can't see the Funko, I 100 percent would be out. You know, like I, I, I it would take like an Asriel Funko for me to buy it. If if you couldn't see it, you know, I would be like, all right, this is a this is a jumping off point. I'm not interested anymore. We we got time. Uh, and, and I have a feeling that, like I said, if it comes if push comes to shove and they see their bottom line drop significantly because of this, they're going to figure out a way to bring them back. Yeah, I really hope so. This is we're going to have to monitor this closely over the, <laughs> over the next couple of years, Joe. Right. Well, well we're here, you know, yeah. we'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> it's the all heat, no heaters, plastic edition, <laughs> plastic yes. update. But all right, that's all I got. I'm glad I got that off my chest. I'm glad you had a, a place to vent. <laughs> Great. All right. So thanks everyone for listening to episode 187 of At Odds with Wrestling. For Adam, this is Joe saying, be safe out there and enjoy some wrestling. You're listening to the soon-to-be-named network, the Lamborghini of Podcast Network.